Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit worldafropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. Worldafropedia.com. My father was a racist, the worst kind. He hated African Americans even though he never met an African-American. He told us that African-Americans were lazy and stupid. When my mother heard that, and she heard him saying the N-word over and over, and then my brothers saying the N-word over and over, she washed their mouths out with zest soap. I never said that word, ever. Ironically, my father, he told us that Black people were lazy and stupid and responsible for everything that was bad in the United States. Yet he was always trying to get everything free, including government cheese. And he stole from our, his employer, shaming our family. He used to take me to a coffee shop called Sambo's. I'm sure some of you might remember this restaurant. And he bought me these books about little black Sambo. I read them. I liked them. He never told me about the racial racial stereotypes that are in those books. But something seemed a little off. He told me Martin Luther King was a terrorist. But isn't this interesting? My father, who never met anybody black, loved to watch black people on TV. He loved Sanford and Son because it reinforced every stereotype that he believed about African Americans. And he loved Archie Bunker not realizing that Archie Bunker is a characterization of the classic American bigot. My dad loved him. Let me tell you a little bit about my school. My school taught me nothing about African American history and culture. What they did teach me is how to participate in a slave auction. I learned how to buy and sell other people. I participated. It felt bad. And no one told us that it actually happened in real life. I remember in seventh grade, we were assigned in our social studies class, everyone was assigned a state, and I took South Carolina. Keep in mind, I had never been out of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I took South Carolina, and my teacher gave me all these resources to learn about South Carolina. And so I made a plantation house, and I made a beautiful southern belle with a blue dress and porcelain skin and black hair and a hat. And I took little twigs and I put them next to the house and I put cotton on top of them and I made this gorgeous plantation house. And in my report, I didn't talk about slavery or who did all the work on that plantation at all because no one ever taught me that in my history class, in my social studies class. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Monday, October 17th, 2016. So I have been told we'll be here the rest of the week every day. Uh, You just tune in. Typical broadcast time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific. We'll be here tomorrow uh, Philip Patrick, uh, his brand new book just published last month, Blood at the Root, uh, about the history of uh, racial cleansings in Forsyth County, Georgia. Uh, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that although he is specifically uh, and exclusively talking about what happened in 1912 in Forsyth County, Georgia, 
this basic thing, whites driving out an entire town of black people, happened uh, according to Buried in the Bitter Water author Elliot Jaspin, who was a guest on our program before, happened more than 250 times in this area of the world, the United States. More than 250 times that this sort of thing happened. I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind uh, when reading the book. But that'll be tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Broadcast for today. <clears throat> Within the last uh, couple of weeks, towards the end of the summer of 2016, there was a report in the Washington Post uh, it was a reprint uh, of an essay that our guest for today had published previously, and it detailed pretty explicitly uh, ways that white faculty members at historically white institutions, ways that they keep black people, black faculty members, uh, from being hired. And it was, as I said, pretty honest. There was not a whole lot of pussyfooting around. It was pretty direct, uh, talking about how this happens uh, consistently uh, at predominantly white institutions. Uh, she wrote this essay, got a lot of attention. Uh, in fact, it generated so much commentary and discussion uh, that they ended up doing a follow-up piece uh, where she got more time to talk about some of the responses that she got from both non-white readers and white readers. I uh, thought it was pretty fascinating, reveals a lot about the system uh, of white supremacy. She is here to discuss the pieces and uh, what she was attempting to convey in these articles with us this evening. Uh, our guest is a professor of higher education in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Her areas of expertise include the history of American higher education, minority-serving institutions with an emphasis on historically black colleges and universities, racism and diversity, fundraising and philanthropy, and higher education leadership. Uh, as I said, she wrote both the pieces that we're going to discuss today in addition to a litany of other books and essays, many of them dealing directly with racism, white supremacy. Our guest joining us live, Professor Mary Beth Gassman. Uh, Mary Beth, are you with us? I am, thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you. So glad you could join us this evening. Uh, I'm sure some of our listeners, this is their first time uh, hearing from you. Uh, just anything that you think would be helpful for listeners to know about who you are in the work that you do? Uh, well, I think that prior to my coming on, you were listening to the TED Talk that I gave about my uh, my father. So um, I uh, don't have the typical Ivy League background, which is typically to be from the Northeast and grow up in a middle to upper class family and be very well educated and have parents who are very well educated. My parents, uh, I, I grew up really poor. Their income together was about $7,000. My mom has an eighth grade education. My dad graduated from high school. And so um, you know, I was the only one out of 10 kids to attend college. And so I have a very, very different background than many of my uh, peers at Ivy League institutions. And I think that that plays a big part in uh, my interest. Uh, everybody has opportunity. And part of that is because I was given opportunity and I was mainly given opportunity by people of color who, uh, uh, took an interest in me and helped me along uh, the way in my career. And so um, I've been uh, very committed to uh, to paying that forward. Hmm. How did uh, these non-white people, how did they become involved in you and assisting your career, your growth along the way? Um, well, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, I don't know how many of your listeners know who Asa Hilliard was, but he's um, a really influential uh, African-American uh, um, psychologist and, and uh, you know, basically focused on child psychology. Um, he was also an Africanist, a historian. Um, he uh, was an early mentor to me and um, I think one of the things that he did is uh, he just had this incredible uh, sense of humanity. And um, when I took the job at Penn, uh, I went and told him, and he looked at me, you know, looked me in the eyes, and he said, Mary Beth, this is a great opportunity for you, but, um, you know, institutions like Penn can uh, put you in a situation where you can lose your soul. And you'll, you know, they dangle everything in front of you, and, they have all these resources, and so if you go there, you have to you have to maintain your integrity and your soul. And so, you know, his words um, 
guided me. He passed away in 2008, but his words guide me and continue to guide me every single day. And I think that, um, you know, that is someone who was my confidant, um, my reference, my mentor, and played an incredible role in my life. And um, other people as well. I mean, most of my work is, is motivated by a man named James Anderson, professor at the University of Illinois, and is the reason why I do the majority of work that I do, just because of his amazing talent and integrity and um, you know, telling me that I could do this work when a lot of people told me that I, I couldn't. And, you know, when I first started doing work related to African American history, some of the white faculty who were working with me in graduate school told me, and they told me that I would not have a career and, um, and that I was wasting my time. I've been told that over and over throughout my entire career, actually. Um, and my, instead of telling me that, James Anderson uh, pushed me forward. And I also had a white professor who named John Thielen who did the same thing. And so the combination of them really pushing me forward made a huge difference. And, you know, for me, I always thought it was interesting that um, African-Americans uh, were so supportive of me whereas many times um, whites weren't. And uh, so to me, um, I, I took that as kind of a call to make sure that I provided opportunity in every way to as many people as I could. And so that's what I spend most of my time doing. Fascinating. Wowee. Uh, I have to highlight that and come back to it. Um, for listeners who have not seen like video or photograph of you, you are a white woman, is that correct? I am. Okay. Uh, I'm a white woman. This program, uh, the context of white supremacy, I use the term racism and the term white supremacy as synonyms. I use the same definition Mm -hmm. for both terms. Uh, The definition I use is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, Do you think such a system exists? Do you think that definition is accurate? Um, Yeah, I would agree that that definition is accurate. Uh, And I do think that, you know, I do wholeheartedly believe that systemic racism is everywhere. I mean, I think it's, I think it's in every country. Um, I think it's uh, in every organization uh, I think there are a lot of people who deny that, but I think it's everywhere. And, you know, one of the things that I tell people often is that if you're white, uh, it, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable in order to um, work to, to chip away or eradicate uh, racism. You, you can't, it can't just stay comfortable because your comfort comes from other people's oppression. So if it makes, if it if it leads to you know other people, um, I don't really use the term non-white because that makes white the norm. But um, but I I would say if it leads to other people of other d- racial and ethnic groups uh, having more opportunity, I think it's perfectly fine for whites to uh, have to give something up and to be uh, uncomfortable. I don't think that most white people feel that way, um, but I but I do feel that way. I, I feel that uh, sometimes. It's, it's important because uh, any time that my happiness is based on other people's oppression, uh, that it's, it's wrong. It's immoral. It's, it's, it's wrong. And, and so, you know, I, I, have to, I have to be upfront about that as a white person. Hmm. I don't know. I just uh, throwing this in quickly, uh, Jane Elliott and I think some of our other guests have had similar dialogue about the use of the term non-white uh the exact reason that she gave for not using it it making it making quote unquote white the norm that's the exact reason that i use the term non-white uh because in dialogue about racism white supremacy the culprits the folks who are most to blame for all of this the individuals classified as white somehow the focus seems to fall away from them consistently where we are talking about the symptoms and the products and we're talking about everything except white people uh, and that's why I use the term non-white to keep the focus on where the problem is um, I've been trying to ask as many of our white guests as possible there was a non-white author uh, he wrote a piece about racism a little over a year ago he said uh, white people are often sincerely and greatly pained by racism but rarely are they pained enough 
And just the first portion of that sentence, uh, you as a white woman, you've been around white family members, friends for the duration of your existence. Uh, do you think that this is an accurate statement? White people are often sincerely and greatly pained by racism. Like, do you think that's true about a sizable number of whites? Um, I don't know if I'd say a sizable number. I'd say um, there are plenty of white people that feel that way. But again, it, it doesn't necessarily move them to justice. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't spend much time around white people. Okay. So, I mean, I, I may five white friends, maybe, maybe uh, two that live, two, two that live in the area. Um, a couple that live long distance. Um, the majority of my friends are black, Latino, uh, Asian American, Pacific Islander, Native American. Um, uh, you know, if I were to look at my social media following, it's predominantly black, maybe some Latinos and Asians, um, not that many whites. And so, um, you know, my, uh, I would say based on my growing up, I, I, I'm, you know, I grew up in an area where nobody cared about racism. Um, I would say based on being at a quote liberal university, I would say that people speak about racism, but I don't think they're necessarily willing to do anything about it. They might even do research about racism, but still not do anything about it in their everyday lives. So, you know, I, I have a little bit of a different life in that I don't live in a predominantly white neighborhood. I sent my daughter to a public school where, you know, it's, uh, 58% black, uh, 22% white, and the remainder would be uh, Asian American and Latino. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that as far as whites today, I know what I see on TV, I know what I see in some of my colleagues at Penn, although um, my center at Penn, out of the 18 people, three white people work there, everybody else is person of color. Uh, and I, people always ask me, how did you do that? And I always say, I just did it. Because it's real easy to have a diverse group of people. All you got to do is do it and actually want to do it. So, um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if I could speak for. I don't know if I could speak for your average white person. I, I don't spend a lot of time with white white folks. Okay, I'm not asking you to to speak for your average yeah. white person. Just your experience as a professor and someone who studies uh, racism. You are white, presumably. You have white family members. You've been around white people. Just your observation uh, on the whites that you've been around. Yeah. And studied, do you think that a significant portion of them? And I'm just trying to get a a, a clear answer on this one because I think this is very important. Whether or not this is a true statement that's being promoted, do you think? that a sizable portion of whites, to your understanding and experience, are often sincerely and greatly pained by racism? Do you think that's true of a sizable portion of whites? Maybe half of them. I, I mean, I honestly, I, 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 but how can you be sincere if you're not willing to act on it? That would be the next thing I would say is if, I, I don't know if it's true sincerity. I think people give lip service to it, but I don't necessarily think they're completely sincere. I'd say about 25% of whites, I do see some sincerity and I do see um, follow through. Uh, so that's, but I maybe 25% sincere with follow through. Uh, but even, you know, it just depends on how uncomfortable they're going to get. You know, so let me, let me tell you a little story. My, my daughter and I were walking down the street one day and, um, so keep in mind, my daughter's whole world is not necessarily, uh, she doesn't really operate in a white world. Uh, all of her friends are, you know, except for maybe one, and she's from Serbia. They're all um, people of color, and she, you know, she, she's not used to being around that many white folks. So, so my daughter and I are walking down the street, and she says, hey, mom, I was just listening to a news story about um, the Black Lives Matter protesters blocking a highway in Atlanta. And I said, oh, well, what do you think about that? And her answer was, well, you know, I can see that people are probably angry because they're blocking the highway. But on the other hand, um, it's making people uncomfortable. It's making sure they can't get to work. It's making sure they're late, that they're, that they're inconvenienced. And she says, you know, that's, that's what racism does. It makes you uncomfortable. It disrupts your life. It makes so you can't concentrate. It makes it so that you can't be your full, live at your full capacity and so, yeah, I think it's really important that protesters push and push and push so that people understand what it's like not to be able to be the full you. So, you know, I, um, 
I think a lot of whites are willing to speak out, but they're not willing to be uncomfortable. And, and um, even my little kid who's 17, right? She, she gets it. She's like, she gets it. She's like, you know, stop complaining about not being able to get to work when people are fearing for their life on the street. You know, they're, they're walking down the street and they're afraid someone's going to murder them. So don't complain about not being able to get through a, a, a protest line because it's not your life. It's just you're late for work. So if my 17... I don't think most whites understand that. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. It would seem the answer would be no, that most uh, whites are not often sincerely and greatly pained by racism, uh, which I think is important. Uh, uh, yeah. Because frequently... I when, would agree. Okay. Frequently, uh, people yeah. promote incorrect ways of thinking about racism and white dedication to white supremacy racism. I would say that would be one illustration. Um, Mary Beth, have you ever, as a white woman, have you ever... Uh, had trouble being honest with non-white people uh, when I say uh, being honest uh, meaning not using the most accurate terms possible when articulating or describing things uh, and or withholding pertinent information so you do speak with the non-white people or you talk with them you're sharing accurate information but you did not tell them everything that you knew uh, that was relevant uh, to what was being said. So in the, that full sense of being honest, have you ever had any problems being honest with non-white people, particularly talking about matters dealing with racism? No, not at all. No, I'm, I'm very frank. I, 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 not at all. I have no hesitancy at all. Wonderful. Uh, and do you think it's logical uh, for any non-white person, any victim of white supremacy, to be suspicious of any individual who is classified as white, including yourself. Oh yeah, I, I think I think I totally think it's logical. I mean, given the way that um, whites have treated uh, people of color throughout the country, whether you're Native American or you know uh, Asian or uh, Latino right now or African American. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I completely get that. I do. You know, I, I think that, um, I, I will like, you know, the other day my daughter and I went into an ice cream parlor and there was a young black man behind the, the, um, register. And, uh, my daughter was wearing a black lives matter t-shirt and, uh, he, his eyes welled up with tears and he said, thank you so much. And I said, you know, I appreciate that, but you don't have to thank us. It's, you know, it's our, it's our obligation. It's our obligation. And I think black, not just wearing a t-shirt, right? That's a step so that people see that it's important. But um, I understand that if we walk in there and we're just two white people walking in and he's, he's there he is a African-American male who probably, you know, I, I, I feel like there's a full scale assault on African-Americans right now in the streets that um, I understand him being suspect of us. I understand that. And I understand people not trusting me. I, I get it. I mean, you know, there, there are lots of white people I'm really hesitant about just because I'm white. I hear what, what people say. I, I, I know what they say. I mean, they don't typically say much about me. If they know me, they won't say anything. If they don't know me, they might say something and make an assumption that I agree with them, and then I'm just going to call them out. Um, you know, I'm 48 years old. I don't really have a lot to lose here. You know, I in terms of calling people out, I'm not going to, I can't, I can't have friends who are people of color and, and, li and, and, you know, at the same time, listen to whites, uh, denigrate them. I, I can't do that. That's, that's, there's no integrity in that. So for me, um, yeah, I understand people being suspect. I completely do. Hmm, okay. Uh, how did your father, James Robert Gassman, practice white supremacy racism um he i mean he did the the race you know said racial slurs every day um including calling you know all the kids in my family racial slurs uh you know keep in mind that there were no african americans where i lived my dad never met anybody african american so um until the end of his life but but um, I, I would say that, uh, you know what the worst thing he did is he tried to convince his children that, uh, that black people were um, inferior. And, and not just black people. I mean, also Latinos and Asians. I mean, he was all the racial slurs. 
So he tried to convince us that, that black people were inferior. I think that that is one of the most desperate things you can do as a white supremacist, try to convince children to be racist. And so many white supremacists do that. So many whites do that. Wow. And what, what, uh, what age do you first remember your dad making, like, racist comments about mm-hmm. black people or non-white people? Like, how old were you when you remember, like, oh, yeah, he's talking about, you know, making his racist comments or whatever? Uh, can you repeat that? It kind of went out a little bit. <clears throat> What's, like, the youngest age that you remember your uh, white father making racist comments? Um... Probably around six or seven, hmm. uh, and I remember exactly what the comment was. Uh, he, um, I asked him if he would get me something. I said, "Daddy, will you uh, go? Uh, will, will you get me something while you're in the kitchen, like some ice cream, right?" And his answer was, "Who was your little N-word last year? Get it yourself." Wow. Wow. He said it all the time. Wow. And, wow. Yeah, and I didn't know what that word meant, so I had never heard that word, but I didn't recognize it, so I asked him, you know, what does that mean? And then he explained what it was. And I, you know, I just looked at him kind of strange, and, and then I heard some of my brothers say that word, and whenever they would say that word in front of my mother, she would wash their mouth out with this zest soap. And she would tell them, you know, don't do that. Your dad is wrong. That's wrong. And, and uh, yeah, that's the first thing I heard. And then, you know, I heard my dad. Um, I started arguing with my dad when I was in about maybe sixth grade. He, uh, you know, I would ask him, why don't you like black people? Why are you telling me this stuff about Martin Luther King? Because even though my school wasn't a great place, I mean, I did actually learn about Martin Luther King. <laughs> that's about the only thing I learned. But I couldn't understand why my dad didn't like uh, Martin Luther King when it seemed like Martin Luther King, to me, as a small child, now I grew up Catholic, okay? So to me, Martin Luther King seemed a lot like Jesus. You know, (laughs) to me, as a little kid, I was like, okay, so he's fighting for others. He gave up his life for something he believed in when he was, and he died at a young age. Um, He he lived for something larger than himself, you know, so here I am going to Catholic school, and my dad, go a, a devout Catholic, you know, praying for, for whatever, and I, so I said to him, Dad, this person seems like Jesus, and my dad was like, no, you know, he's a terrorist, and I said, that's what they said about Jesus, you know, so I'm trying to explain, I mean, you know, uh, um, when people didn't use the word terrorist, but it's similar words. So I, um, I would push back at him, just ask him. And so it really caused a rift uh, to the point where at one point he told my mom that I should go see um, a counselor because, you know, there must be something wrong with me. So the interesting thing is here you have a kid pushing back. And I was, keep in mind, I'm in the midst of all white kids. There, there are no people of color where I grew up. So I'm in the midst of all white kids, and I, I realize that something is not right, and I start to push back. And what my father does is say that there must be something wrong with me, right? So that's another form of white, white supremacy in, in that, oh, you're crazy. You're not really experiencing that. You're not, real, you're not right. There must be something wrong with you. I mean, how many times are, are, are people of color told that? Daily. So. Mm-hmm. Um, what I was just curious really quick, what, what did, what was your father's explanation when you asked him, nigger, what does that mean? How did he explain it? Oh, he said that it's, um, a black person. And, and I said, I don't understand that. He's like, you know, it's a bad name for a black person. And I, and I said, well, then why are you saying it? And he said, because they don't deserve better names. And I just, you know, I just said, well, it's, uh, you know, mom said not to say that word. And so he's like, yeah, well, I say it. And I said, well, mom said it's a bad word. Because my mom grew up, grew up in um, Flint, Michigan. So she grew up in an integrated community and had moved up near where my dad lived. At, you know, at some point, she, her first husband died. So he had moved her up there. And then she was up there with, you know, kids and everything. And she met my dad and didn't really know he was like this for a few years. And so 
Um, so my mom had lived around black people, and so she told me, uh, you know, your dad is crazy. This is not true. She's like, you know, you should never use that word. It's a terrible word. And I've never said that word in my entire life, and I never. Uh, I didn't want to. Or will. You know, and, and so I, I think that white people have absolutely no, uh, they, they shouldn't, it, it should never, why would you even want to say that word as a white person? What's wrong with you? <laughs> it doesn't I, uh... make any sense. I'm not. I am not bothered about uh, whites saying the word nigger at all. Uh, in fact, it makes it easier, in my opinion, uh, to be able to point out and identify white supremacists, racists, uh, as opposed to them being sneakier about it. I didn't want to to bog down in this too much because I did want to get to your, your some of your writings because I think that's really important. But this this one point because it comes up frequently where it will be. Mm -hmm. The white man, the father figure, he is the racist. He's the one spewing nigger and, you know, whatever else, calling black people bad names. And it will be the white mom is not racist. She's the one that said, oh, man, your dad is, you know, he's crazy or whatever. Whatever excuse. Don't be like him. Don't say nigger, that sort of thing. And I have a hard time accepting. To me, it seems very illogical uh, for that white woman to not to think of her as also being a racist. In this case, we'd be talking about your mom. Because it's very hard for me to believe that you didn't know that your father, James Robert Gassman, was a racist, that he had never said nigger prior to the marriage. You didn't have any idea that he had these sort of white supremacist leanings. That's very difficult for me to believe. And we're talking like 19, what, 1940s, 1950s. Like that makes it even more difficult to believe. Plus, I've, I've kind of heard this story before. Uh, and then once you find yeah. out that this person is racist, now what? And if you're staying with them, that's yeah. not grounds for a divorce. I mean, it's just, it's very difficult to make logical sense of that. What would your response be? Well, I, I would agree that it's difficult, but I don't think that you understand what it's like to be a woman in the country. And I also don't think you understand poverty the way that my, my mother is poverty. So let me explain something to you. And I, I've never heard my mom say anything negative about any other. Okay, so... Here's what I would say. My mom has an eighth grade education. She's semi-illiterate. So just think about that. She, when she met my father, she had seven children and her husband had died and she was a cleaning lady. Okay. So just for a minute, think about being, having seven children with you. So, and you, you have no education and you clean people's houses. All right. So my mother was on, you know, welfare. I grew up completely on welfare. Um, and, and so when she met my father, you know, he was a bachelor. She meets him. She, uh, she falls in love with him. He was, a lot of men pr present themselves as upstanding when you first meet them. I know I, you may have never did men, but let me tell you, they do it. Okay. So she meets him. And, and what, the way that she talked to me, and I don't remember much of this when I was really little, but is that, you know, she married him because she needed someone to help her raise her children. And she ended up finding out he was very different to, from what he presented himself as. Um, and so uh, my mom really, uh, my mom was abused both, you know, verbally and in many ways physically. Um, my, my, and, and in the TED Talk, I talk about um, the way that he verbally abused her was really awful. But I want you to think about where is she supposed to go when she is not from the area, she's got seven kids, okay? Um, I don't know, but my mom eventually did divorce my dad. Eventually, when she got older and her kids got a little bit older and she just couldn't take it anymore, um, she divorced my dad, uh, which was very controversial for her to do. And she divorced my dad, and she didn't want anything to do with him anymore. But I think it took a long time for her to be able to do that because financially she didn't know what to do. She did. She didn't. She had no idea what to do. And, and then, you know, the other thing is I grew up with no running water, an outhouse, you know, 12 people in a two bedroom house. So I, I didn't grow up in like I'm not saying like poverty the way people throw around poverty. I'm saying that I grew up in like ridiculous poverty. And and so I I mean, I my mom hated everything that my dad stood for. But I, I, I think, you know, my mom's an 85 year old woman. My mom was born in 1930. So to leave that situation at that time, I just don't feel like she felt like she had a choice. Um, she could have left, but I don't know what would have happened to all of us. Mm. I don't know. 
I don't know what would have happened. But I do know that I watched my mom. My, I think my mom, you know, my mom is really incredibly brave and in, incredibly, you know, open-minded and loving and caring and, and felt completely free when she got away from him. You know, she finally started to live. She finally started to be able to breathe. Um, but I think, you know, um, a lot of women stay with men who abuse them and are terrible to them for a variety of reasons, and that is not, uh, that, that isn't based on race. It happens across all racial and ethnic groups. Okay, let me hop because in. Because women yeah. are deeply abused. So. Right on. <laughs> let me, let me uh, hop in. Uh, if anyone, listeners, uh, feel free. It's been lobbed before if you think I'm just being sexist or patriarchal here in my assessment, but uh, I would just say again, I've heard this, this is not an individual assessment or indictment of your parents or anything like that, it's just I've heard this uh, repeatedly where it gets presented that it's the white male figure that is racist and the white woman is not or in many instances, in fact, she's being abused, Uh, she you know, it's white male patriarchy and and she's a victim too, that's presented a lot when people are talking about Uh, plantation era, white supremacy, that narrative gets presented a lot. And I just, I reject that. You could not have this system without equal uh, participation from white women and white men. And I've just heard too many stories beyond just what Mary Beth is sharing with us today. I've heard too many of these types of stories where it is the white woman is not racist, the husband is. And to me, it just does not add up being logical that you have all of these white females being consistently duped where they didn't know that this person was racist until way down the road or whatever other mitigating circumstances where they got to end up being stuck with a racist that just does not jive, does not make logical sense at all and consistently absolves white women of responsibility for this which I think is a major act of white supremacy um, but like I said I didn't want to get bogged down into that um, kind of no but hold on hold on hold on hold up hold you, uh, you took so a long time to respond I gave you a lot of time and I didn't interrupt I just I don't want to get bogged down to that I've heard your position on it I understand we don't agree but I do want to no no but sentence. you invited me on and I'm going to say something I mean I completely agree with you that there mm-hmm. is Complete complicity by white women. Can you make this, this like really brief? Can you make this really brief? Yes, I can. Okay. But I, I, I believe, I agree with you. I agree with you completely. All women across the whole country are treated, you know, within marriages and historically have been treated. I, I completely agree with you. In almost all cases, I agree with you. But I also think, you know, there's a difference between... Uh, an educated white woman, who, woman who's rich on a plantation and a poor white woman who has no education, there's a difference. And I'm not saying my mom would do. She may have known that. You know, she may have known that. But what I do know is that she raised her children not think that, and she left him as soon as she got on her feet to be able to do it. So I, I, think, I don't think it's, it's a black and white issue. I don't think it's – I think there's, there's some gray there when you're talking about the combination of sexism and racism and, and abuse. So I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's one way or the other. I think right. there's uh, some complexities there. Right on. Ready to uh, move forward. Uh, getting to uh, the essays, and just for the record, I am not talking about racism and sexism. I said specifically context of white supremacy, just to be clear about that. Uh, moving to uh, your essays, uh, the first one, an Ivy League professor on why colleges don't hire more faculty of color. We don't want them. Again, this was republished uh, in the Washington Post. Uh, it was out uh, earlier um, where you just kind of give a lot of the reasons, strategies, techniques that are used by white faculty to keep from hiring uh, black faculty members and or to explain why they don't have black faculty members, non-white faculty members. What was your purpose for writing this essay to begin with? Well, my essay is not about black faculty members. My essay is about faculty of color, and that includes all racial and ethnic groups that would be non-white. So I specifically did not write about black faculty. All of the comments I received were about black people, but the, the essay was not. It's about faculty of color in general. So I, I wrote the essay because for years, and I've, this, this essay is not the first time I've been saying this. I've been saying this in talks across the country. I've written this in many peer-reviewed articles. I've written these kinds of things in books. Just for some odd reason, this Washington Post piece um, hit a nerve, and 
on stage at the New York Times Higher Education Forum, and the um, uh, commentator who was interviewing me asked me a question. She said, why don't we have more diversity at majority institutions? And my response was, because we don't want them. Because, and then I gave her all the reasons, what the things that, that happen at majority institutions that send a signal to me that people are not truly dedicated to having a more diverse faculty. And so afterwards, um, someone from the Hackinger Report came up to me, and that's where it was first published, and said, would you write that down? Are you willing to say that? And I said, yes, I'm willing to say that. And so I wrote this essay in the Hackinger Report, and then the Washington Post reposted it, or they, they added a little bit, and they reposted it. And um, the whole essay is basically written about all of the excuses that people use to not have a diverse faculty. And these are things, again, that I've been writing about for a long time and speaking about and pushing back against on an every, everyday basis, either at my own institution, at previous institutions, or institutions where I go and give talks around the country. So it wasn't necessarily new for me, but it, it hit a nerve. And like I said, I, I got over 6,000 emails uh, based on this essay. Hmm. Would it be accurate? My interpretation of this uh, to me suggests, particularly since there's so many uh, different elaborate uh, excuses or justifications given at so many different institutions by so many different whites, would it be accurate to say that this essay would serve as proof that whites, they are not ignorant about racism, that this is not a problem of white people being ignorant, that they don't understand racism in terms of black faculty members, non-white faculty members not being hired? I think all white people understand racism, and if they tell you that they don't, I think that they're lying. I, I think all white people know what racism is. They know it when they hear it. They know it when they see it. I, I, I think they all know. They, they all know. Hmm. That is pretty profound. I would definitely highlight that one because that... You're saying like the exact opposite of what the vast man, when I say vast, like I would say more than 80 percent of the people that I hear talk about this problem, white supremacy, racism, they consistently insist that whites, that they're ignorant, that they just don't understand racism, that they don't have to think about racism. They just don't know how it works. And I consistently push back that so that is absurd. If you're white, you cannot be ignorant about racism. You have to know we're not supposed to be hiring uh, non-white faculty members at our institutions. Uh, just whatever the area of people activity is, we're not supposed to be giving them loans. We're not supposed to allow them to buy houses here. You're supposed to know these things, and you will get in trouble with other whites if you break these rules. Is that accurate to your understanding, Mary Beth? Um, I think that I think that white people know what racism is. I, I don't know I don't know if you'll get in trouble with other whites if you don't abide by the rules. I will say that, that people will make your life uncomfortable and they might try to publicly shame you. They might, you know, in my case, people call my phone and leave really nasty messages, email me nasty messages, um, uh, try to intimidate me and things. I don't really care, but, um, but they, uh, they will do that. So, um, and I do think that there's a certain... Um, that there is an unspoken code or a, a rule that, you know, if you do this, you're a traitor to your race. I mean, this is the same thing we saw with, like, whites going uh, south in, in the, during the civil rights movement with the voter registration kind of uh, activities, um, the whole idea that you're a traitor to your race, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think white people know what racism is. They know what it looks like. They know what it feels like. They know it when they see it. Uh, they they know, and they know not only individual racism, but they know systemic racism. And they also know when they benefit from racism. So they know when they are benefiting from being in a, you know, a supreme position, as you want to use the right, white supremacist term. They know. They know. They know. So, I mean, I, I think they know, and they get angry when you tell them that they know. Mm -hmm. I agree a thousand percent. In fact, I, I insist this is one of the, a big problem that we're having in terms of how many non-white people are encouraged to think about this problem, that whites are, are ignorant about racism and we just need to get them a few workshops so that they understand racism. I contend that is not the issue 
at all. Uh, the issue is just that they are dedicated to continuing practicing white supremacy racism. Uh, you said from this talk where you said this, where these essays kind of grew from, uh, you said that <clears throat> the audience was surprised by your candor, gave you a round of applause for the honesty. In terms of the, demogra the demographics of your audience, like was it predominantly non-white people? Was it an even mix? Who were these people that were applauding? Uh, well, they're all leaders in higher education across the country. It was like an invitation-only event um, that the New York Times was hosting. And I would say that there were probably uh, 400 people in the audience, and uh, 300 of them were probably white, 100 uh, people of color. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, probably about, it was probably about, you know, 75% white. Seven, wow. Okay. And a lot of the whites. I got a, I got a standing ovation. Wow. And a lot of the whites there, they were happy with, with your candor? Uh, they stood up and applauded. And, you know, here's one thing. Um, uh, many of the people who were there were leading institutions that have a lot of um, uh, students of color who attend them. So they might have been uh, uh, Hispanic-serving institutions, historically black colleges. Um, there were a few tribal college leaders. But there were also uh, institutions that are incredibly diverse. So, you know, like a temple here in Philadelphia is incredibly diverse. Or a Georgia State University in Atlanta, incredibly diverse. No, no white majority in those institutions. And so there were leaders like that. And they felt that I was... Um, you know, a lot of times people know, they, they know, and I think, um, I think they were applauding me for being honest. I, I, I was just, I was being honest, you know, I, um, I want a diverse faculty because I know that that not only is that the moral thing to do, but it's also the best thing to do. It's the best thing to do for everyone involved, including the faculty, the students, uh, the nation. It's the best thing to do. And, um, and it, it's, it's just, there's no other way from my perspective than to have a diverse faculty. You know, we, we need to have people um, who are um, representative of the people in the classes. And, and what we know is that, that the um, classrooms, uh, like the K-12 through population right now, has been over 50% students of color for the past two years. And colleges and universities, their, their student bodies are more and more diverse. And it's just, I mean, even if they weren't diverse, we should have a diverse faculty. But the fact that the faculty is 76% white, it, that's just not right. That's not right. Hmm. It's not right. Context of white supremacy, our guest, Professor Mary Beth Gassman, uh, you write, uh, I have learned that faculty will bend rules, knock down walls, and build bridges to hire those they really want, often white colleagues, but when it comes to hiring faculty of color, they have to play by the rules and get angry when any exceptions are made. Uh, I kind of summed up that whole portion as discretion, uh, which is something that I point out all the time. That's one of the major ways uh, that whites practice white supremacy racism, where these are the rules, but in this instance, we might not have to follow every exact rule, or the rules allow for me to have some discretion with how I want to handle uh, this particular situation, where in those type of situations, whites always get the benefit of the doubt, or they get whatever extra goodies can come with having that sort of leeway, and conversely, non-whites, I would say especially black people, end up getting the worst of those types of outcomes. Just can you talk about how this discretion plays out in the hiring process at white institutions? Well, I think that what happens is that um, exceptions are made for white people. So if a white person doesn't have everything that you need, well, there's always a reason. If, uh, you know, if, 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 a white per if you really want a white person, you can find the money to bring the white person in. But for some reason, you can't find the money to bring the black person in or the Latino person in. So, um, or if, if let's say there's um, a need for a certain kind of protocol in order to hire the person, well, you can make exceptions to that protocol because the white person had the right mentor. Uh, these are all things that I've seen. Whereas if, you know, you can't make those exceptions for a black person because a couple people have pushed back at me about this and said, yeah, but what about targets of opportunity? So 
in most um, institutions, there are these things called targets of opportunity, which if there's a really talented person, it doesn't have to be based on race, but it's something that, especially at like um, highly selective, you know, more, um, I would say, more highly selective institutions, uh, there are these things where people will say, well, if it's somebody we really, really want, then we don't have to go through the regular search process. And by and large, most of the people who get hired that way are people of color, and they're really talented people of color. They want to take them from another institution, bring them in. Um, so people will push back and say, yeah, but there are these targets of opportunity. Well, the reason why we have targets of opportunity is because so few people of color get chosen through the regular search processes. So I think these, the target of opportunity is a really, a, a really important thing, but there are lots of people that are resentful of that. And if oftentimes if we didn't have those, it would be even more difficult to get a more diverse faculty. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I think that's probably the thing that angered people the most is that I, um, I talked about people uh, knocking down bridges, you know, building walls, anything that they could do in order to bring in the white candidate with the great mentor who is the perfect candidate uh, in, in, in so many people's eyes, right? And when I have seen this happen, and I've seen it happen many, many places, I always speak up and I say, this is systemic racism. Write what you're doing right now. This is it. This, this is what it looks like. So if, if you ever can't figure out what it looks like, I'm going to show you right now. Here's what it looks like. Mm. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> it's, and I reminded, we had a report, this is from a few years back, it was a black doctor in North Carolina, but he, he contributed to NPR's uh, race card project, and it was, you, I think he used like mm -hmm. six words to make a phrase about racism, and his six words were, 55 miles per hour means you, black boy, and uh, he, exp he just explained that he felt like the rules were only there to keep him in line basically that he always has to obey the rules it doesn't matter that he got this great doctor's degree and you know he's a physician and makes all this money and did really well i think he went to an ivy league school as well all that doesn't matter race trumps everything was his conclusion and that the rules are there to just make sure he's kept in line that's what it reminded me of and i, I think the inverse where with whites as you said they will build bridges they will knock down walls whatever needs to be done to get the white person in it is the exact opposite for black people we will knock down bridges we will build walls whatever needs to be done because we do not want them here and i think it's important at least my perspective this is all areas of people activity this is not just the ivory towers where this sort of thing happens this oh is it's all over the place exactly ubiquitous <laughs> worldwide yeah uh no are, it's all it's all over the place yeah you also wrote, you said in 2014, for the first time, the nation's K-12 through student population was majority minority. These students are on their way into colleges and universities, and we are not prepared for them. Our current faculty lacks expertise in working with students of color, and our resistance to diversifying the faculty means that we are not going to be ready anytime soon. Just in your assessment, uh, average typical whites in this area of the world, how are they feeling, what are their concerns about non-white children being the majority in the U.S. for the first time? Are they happy about that? What is their assessment of that, typical whites? Well, here's the interesting thing. I don't hear anybody talking about it. You know, I, I mean, oddly enough, I don't hear many faculty talking about it. I hear the younger faculty. So, you know, the younger faculty at most institutions is much more diverse, much more open-minded, um, much more progressive. But you hear the younger faculty, but they've already been taught to teach a diverse class. But, the, but the, you know, the people who are 40 and up, um, I don't really hear them talking about it. I will say that overall, I think that part of the reason why we have all this crap going on in the country right now is because a lot of white people realize that their center of uh, gravity is going to move, and it's going to move very quickly. It's moving as we speak. And so, you know... I, I think that makes people afraid, um, especially if you happen to be, if you happen to know how you feel about people of color and you wonder if they're going to feel that way about you when they're the majority. So, I, I, you know, that's happened in other countries as well. If you look at South Africa, for example, right? You had all these, these white people who ended up leaving and going to Europe or Australia. apartheid and they more than likely left because they knew how they had treated blacks and and they certainly didn't want to be treated that way so i think that there are people who are afraid um i wouldn't say that 
that fear necessarily plays out in education circles. I think um, I hear a lot of people talk about, especially at the K through 12 level, I don't hear people talk about it as much at the higher education level. You know, at the K through 12 level, it's 83% whites who are teaching children in public schools. 83%. And then 76% whites who are teaching in higher education. And, and so, um, we, I think we got to stop talking about this and all make an effort to change it. You know, you got, we've got to make an effort to change it. Everybody not, you know, I don't think this is the burden on people of color. I think that this is also, um, and I wouldn't call it a burden on whites at all. I think it's an, it's an obligation. It's an obligation that you do something. I mean, you know, I, when we first started off, I was talking about how my life has really been in many ways. I've tried to dedicate myself to creating opportunity, something I learned from an African American man. And, um, and for me, you know, I've had 60 doctoral students out of those 60 doctoral students that I've had across my entire career thus far, you know, my 16 years of being a professor, um, the, uh, I, I think the last time I looked, 87% of them are students of color. So that's really important to me because you know what I can do? I can help produce more future faculty members and I can also equip them with the tools that they need in order to be able to operate in this system that they might enter. You know, I mean, because they have to have a heads up. They have to. And I can ensure that they, you know, go to institutions that appreciate them rather than um, mistreat them. So, um, you know, for me, that, that's really important. You, we we, we got to do that. We, I, I, I just think we have to. All of us. Hmm. You wrote a follow-up piece uh, to your first post that was uh, republished in the Washington Post. Uh, the second piece, uh, what people did when an Ivy League professor wrote faculty of color don't get jobs because we don't want them. Uh, and kind of <clears throat> in the introduction to this piece, kind of letting people know how this evolved, uh, they wrote Gassman, who holds secondary appointments in history, Africana studies, and the School of Social Policy and Practice at Penn, writes here that the responses provided further evidence that racism remains entrenched in academia. Can you give us a few specific examples of how the responses evidenced uh, the entrenchment of racism in academia? Sure. Uh, well, the first thing I would say is out of the 6,000 emails, and actually I'm almost up to 7,000 now, but, but out of the 6,000 emails, about 4,000 of them were from people of color, mainly, I'd say, blacks and Latinos, um, but a few Native Americans and some Asian Americans, because Asian Americans are also underrepresented in the academy. Uh, and um, they all told me about their experiences. I mean, really, really uh, gut-wrenching experiences that I have heard many times before. But they told me, you know, just saying, I want you to know I support you. Thank you so much for writing this. And I wrote back to every single one of those people, every single one, and, and just told them how important it was to me that they reached out. I also heard a lot from, I think about maybe 1,500 of them were whites who admitted to um, either admitted to being racist and noticing it and trying and doing everything they could to change their mind, admitted what they had done in the past and said they were working to really um, to create opportunity now, but that they had to admit that they had done these things. And then I had a lot of whites who um, said, you know, I am trying everything I can at the ground level to fight like you are, and I just really appreciated it. It gave me a lot of strength to know that there are other people who, you know, notice these things and don't want to uh, just leave them, leave them there. Right. And then, um, and I'll just tell you about this one example that I think this is, this example is indicative of the majority of the responses that I got from white uh, faculty at institutions across the country who were really, really angry at what I wrote. And um, so, you know, I had, uh, this um, one, this one person, wrote, and who wrote to me and basically uh, told me that I, you know, told me that I was naive, et cetera, et cetera. And um, he writes, um, "Too often, the black professorial caucuses are militant agitators. At my institution, they've just about wrecked the place. They've gotten the black students so fired up." 
they are demanding separate lodging, separate dining halls, and separate student centers. They have also forced colleges to institute extreme curtailments on freedom of speech and thought. It is ironic at my institution, the militants who hate the place so much will leave the school with no student loan debt in accordance with the school's financial aid policies. There's gratitude for you. Integration, which is there's gratitude for you, is a really powerful statement. Integration on the college campus is just not working. I'm sorry. I wish it would, but the facts are the facts. And, to, you know, I received a lot of emails about that. And what I will tell you is that I wrote the essay about faculty of color. I never mentioned black or African American in the entire essay. And all of the negative comments, every single one, there was not one exception, were about African Americans. Everyone. Hmm. What does that suggest to you about the unique place that black people hold in the mind of racist man, racist woman? I, I mean, I think that, well, what I tried to explain in, in this essay is that, you know, this visceral hate for African Americans, to me, has to do with um, the idea that the presence, the mere presence of African Americans, I think for many whites, reminds them of slavery, you know, beatings, rape, Jim Crow, discrimination, the murders, the lynchings, the theft, all of the other atrocities that have been hurled at and perpetrated on African Americans in this country, um, it reminds whites of that. And they like to pretend to live in a colorblind society and, uh, and that, you know, it's all better now. And, and that's, that's not true. I mean, right now we have all of the things that I just talked about, all of the things I listed. If you were to just say the prison, you know, the prison industrial complex could be equal to slavery, right? So all of the other things, the beatings, the rapes, the discrimination, Jim Crow, the way it still plays out, murders, it's still happening. And so, so for me, it has to do with this idea of, African Americans making whites uncomfortable, and I'm not going to say all whites, but I will say there's a there's from the the 500 emails I got roughly 500 that were hateful emails about African Americans. They all were mad because they thought that African Americans were getting something that they weren't getting, that African Americans were given a special favor. And keep in mind, I never said at one point. Did I ever say, oh, we should just let, you know, anybody be a professor? I, I, I'm talking about people who are PhD'd, who are highly qualified individuals, who have all the credentials that we look for, and we still don't want to let people in. So, um, I, I, um, I, yeah, I think there, there's this uncomfortableness and this idea that, you know, whites enjoy the position of superiority that they're in, and they protect that privilege. And they get really angry when you say something about it, which is why I've been called every name you can possibly think of. <laughs> so. hmm. In your uh, in your essay, in the, this is the follow up essay. Uh, you have a paragraph. I'm just replacing one word. I want you to tell me if it is still accurate. Replacing the one word. I am removing the word privilege, which you just said, and replacing it with power. Uh, but you write, ensuring that African Americans have opportunity and equity means interacting with them daily, having to listen to their voices and perspectives, having to remi- having to be reminded of what many whites do and have done to remain in superior positions and protect their power. Uh, with that replacement, is it still accurate? Is the integrity of what you wrote still there? Oh yeah, I mean privilege and power. Yeah, uh, they work together. Yeah. Okay. What- yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. What uh, on this program, I consistently I discourage listeners from using the word privilege, white privilege. When talking about this, uh, I'm of the opinion privilege is it's a pretty passive way of talking about all of the things whites have done, are doing to maintain domination over non-white people, particularly black people. Uh, And I think frequently the way that privilege gets used, whites will talk about all the abundance of white privilege that they have, but they uh, have a very difficult time talking about ways, things that they do to practice racism. Uh, And I've pointed that out consistently with our listeners, that that, for me, is a problem, that you can list the police don't follow me, and I can get Band-Aids my color, and I get, you know, they make it easy for me to get jobs, and all these things, but nobody lists specific things that they do to make sure that white supremacy remains intact. Uh, What are your thoughts about the Mm -hmm. difference between the word power, privilege? I mean, I definitely think they're different. I tend not to be um, someone who 
fixates on uh, the idea of white privilege uh, in the way that a lot of people do. Um, I, I, you know, the word power, I, I could use that as well. I will say that I don't think it's enough to just point out privilege or, you know, like if you are talking about white privilege, it's not enough just to point it out. I mean, you need to be dismantling it. So, um, and, and you also have to do that with white power. You know, you need to, you need to dismantle it. And, and that might mean that you have to give up something. Like some of the uh, things that um, you you benefit from because others are oppressed, you know that you might have to give something up. Can you think of any ways? Uh, you almost fifty. Uh, can you think of any ways in your time on the planet that you have practiced racism, white supremacy? Um, I I don't know. I mean, I try every day to live my life uh, in the very best uh, way that I can for others. And uh, I would say that at the center of every single day would be um, ensuring that I try to create opportunity for others rather than take away opportunity. So um, that's not something that I focus on. But I will tell you that I surround myself with people who would call me out at any point if I did. Um, and like, if I, if I were to ever make an assumption or say something that invoked privilege or power and, 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 uh, and was dismissive of others or anything like that, I think that the people that I, um, choose to live my life around and who choose to live around me, uh, would, um, would say something in a minute to me and I would want them to, you know, I would want them to push back at me and, um, so, but it's not, that's not something that, that I, um, I'm sure that there are prejudices that I have in life. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know what they are beyond, I don't like tattoos very much, but, um, but, uh, at this point, you know, I am 48 years old and I've spent a long time doing research in this area. So I've grown a lot over time. And my reasons for doing things have grown a lot. But um, I think one of the things that you have to do in order to maintain your integrity is you have to be open to the fact that you could be wrong. You have to be open to thinking. You have, I mean, really, really reflecting and thinking. You have to be open to people um, pushing, pushing at you and, and challenging you. And um, that doesn't mean you can't push back, but it also means that you, you have to be open to that. You can't just assume that you uh, know better because of your position or, you know, where you are in the world. But I, I will say that I probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, about that, um, you know, uh, but I, I do every day wake up thinking, you know, how can I make, um, how can I create more opportunity? How can I uh, find ways to push back against systems that, uh, that, uh, eliminate eliminate opportunity or curtail opportunity for others, including you know the, I, my work isn't just about race. I think it's impossible to um, se separate things. So I think you know for me it also has to do with issues of sexuality and gender and a variety of other kinds of you know it might have to do with religion. Uh, the discrimination against Muslims is, is really pervasive right now. So um, for me it has to do with that. But I would say you know I'm always learning. I'm always learning, and I'm very very open to someone like my students or saying, you know, I, I don't know, maybe you should rethink that. Or may, maybe, you know, you're exercising some privilege by saying that. I would, I'm very, very open to that. And uh, I think that's important. I think that's important. Have any non-white people ever accused or suspected you of practicing racism that you know of? Um, I have had, it's been a long time, but I would say that I have had people who did not know me, uh, wonder if I, um, you know, it got back to me. And so I just called him up and said, Hey, I heard you wonder this and you want to talk. And so, um, because I'm a really, you know, I told you, I'm, I'm not really afraid of very much. Um, so I just called him up, talked and, you know, most, I would say in every one of those cases, and there are probably only three, but, um, they were usually students who were new to the institution and, you know, they saw that I was white and, and just weren't sure what to think. And I completely understand that. So I just called them up and said, would you like to go out for coffee, get to know each other and talk to a little bit about my motivations and where I'm coming from. And, you know, some of them, 
uh, warmed up and others it took a while. You know, some people might take like three years and then they might say, hey, you know what, I, um, I, I want to talk to you again. And, and I, would, I would do that. Um, you know, given the history in the country, I understand that. But, um, yeah, I mean, on occasion I might have somebody like that, but not very much anymore. I mean, I would say rarely ever anymore. Um, not that people don't doubt, you know, because some people, I, I would say the, the most I ever get it is if someone is new to doing work related to historically black colleges and will ask, you know, why is that white woman interested in that topic? And um, that's a legitimate question. I, I, I mean, I, I, I wonder when I see a white person interested in, you know, <laughs> in Berkeley black colleges, I want to know why, you know. So um, that's a legitimate question. And I, I think those are legitimate questions. And I'm willing to answer them. It's fine. Hmm. And I also think that I'm not above making a mistake. So, you know, I'm, I, I make mistakes all the time. So, um, and, but if I did, I would apologize. I would reflect. And I would uh, try to change my ways. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, that's the best you can ask for, for people. Uh, you, you, they, you have, that's where it all starts is hmm. being open to the fact that you might be wrong. Hmm. You had uh, one of the people that wrote in, this is a black uh, professor, she wrote in, I wanted to get an on-air response. Uh, she said, uh, or you wrote, one African-American woman wrote, despite having terrific credentials and applying for over 200 faculty positions, I have been denied for a faculty position over and over, making me wonder if pursuing a PhD was worth it. I wonder if I should discourage other African-Americans from doing so. Uh, if this person were listening, what would you say to her? Um, well, I, I wrote back to her and I told her, uh, I don't think you should discourage people from pursuing or African Americans from pursuing PhDs. I do understand that kind of feeling, but that I think, you know, we need to, um, we need to work on changing the environment that they're going into. And, um, and then I also put her in touch with, um, with, uh, a few people in her area who I, where I thought that, that they might really enjoy, uh, working with her. Um, cause there were a lot of people who asked me if I could help them with the job search. So, um, but I, um, no, I don't think you should discourage, but you have to prepare, you know, like one of my, uh, students last year, a young African American woman, um, who's now a professor and, uh, and, you know, I made sure that she was prepared for what she was going into. And I didn't just do that by talking to her myself. I had three African-American women who I, you know, I'm very close with at Penn who are highly successful and have navigated a lot of, you know, murky waters in their life at different institutions. I um, suggested that she uh, go for coffee or lunch with them because I told her as a white woman, I can prepare you for some things, but I can't prepare you for everything. Um, and I need you to talk to these women. And, and she did. And she, you know, she came back and she said, thank you for doing that because it was incredibly empowering. And they were incredibly positive and told her, you know, this is what you need to do. Here's how you navigate this. Here's, you know, you need the, it's important to have these allies and, and to take these steps. And so, you know, sometimes people have to know um, their limits and where, you know, I can do so much, but I can never, ever tell you what it's like to be black. America because I'm not black and so I can't tell this young woman okay oh it's going to be like this as a white woman I can tell you blah 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 what I can tell her is this is what my experience was this is how I navigate politics but you're going to need some special armor so let me have you talk to some people who I know have some really good armor and so you know that to her that was incredibly helpful and I think she's going to be incredibly successful and um, she'll, there'll be bumps in the road. For so, um, everyone who wrote to me who said, you know, I I really liked your essay. Some a lot of people said they cried. Um, people said, um, but it, you know, it's hard because I want to be a professor. And I told them, I said, well, one thing you need to know is there are there are really good people out there who will watch out for you. They will protect you, and they will help you navigate the murky waters. And and, uh, you know, I offered to help in, in every one of the emails that I sent. Uh, and I know people could say, oh, you can't do that. But on the other hand, you know, I have hundreds of young people, uh, the majority African-American across the country, who write to me constantly asking for advice. And I respond to every single person. 
I, I just, you know, I never want to be the, um, you never know when you're the one person who can change someone's life. And for me, I remember when I was young and I wrote to somebody who was well known and I asked them for help. And I remember the people who said yes. And I remember the people who didn't help me. And, and I would always rather be the person who, who, who said yes. And so um, that's really important to me. I, uh, so I wouldn't discourage people. I would say, you know, fight back. Hmm. There was another African-American uh, writer. Uh, he wrote back to you, and you included this in the paper. You said, uh, one African-American man wrote, I'm actually optimistic that if people read your essay and reflect, perhaps they will change. Sometimes it takes being shamed to change your ways and to see the world from the perspectives of others. Uh, based on your research, uh, and again, nearly a half century uh, in existence as a white woman, uh, have you collected any evidence that a substantial number of whites are going to be shamed or persuaded into voluntarily discontinuing the practice of white supremacy racism? Well, I don't know about the overall practice of it in their every moment of their life. Um, I think that, you know, you... You have to start somewhere and then start working on it. But what I will say, the best thing that has come out of this article is the number of people who have written to me and said, my dean brought this to a meeting, my provost brought this to a meeting, my president brought this to a meeting, I brought this to a meeting, and regardless of their racial or ethnic background. Um, and and um, it, It was um, people talked about it in this meeting or this professional organization. I've received hundreds of emails like that. That's good, you know, because what happens is now when there's a search committee, somebody can, for a faculty position, somebody can pull this out. And when people start using those excuses, they can say, hey, did you read this article where she talks about how this excuse is used over and over and over? And so, you know, that to me is one of the most powerful things. That's how you, that's how you got to break, you got to break. Um, systems, and I'm not saying that, you know, uh, many other people have said the things that I've said. Okay, many other people have said them. I don't know why this one particular article um, caught on. I don't know why. It, you know, I, like I said, I've written over 300 opinion essays, and I've never, except for one other one, I've never had a response like this. And so, but I think it's really good. I think it's really good that people are taking it to meetings, are presenting it, are um, are sending it to leadership. I think that's really, really important. That is, this is one question where I'm kind of going back because I didn't get an answer, and I'm not the type of person, just based on my understanding of research, where just because I wouldn't care if every institution in this part of the world took your report uh, to their meeting, to convocation, to anything where all the faculty were required to read this and we're going to have a symposium for a week. I've seen where that sort of thing happens a lot and nothing substantially changes. Uh, that they have a lot of nice speeches and people will say a few things and then you just get right back to the business of practicing racism. And that's why I think it's very important in terms of people thinking are whites as a result of reading this or any other exercises that people come up with, are you going to have a substantial number of whites who are going to say, you know what, it's time that we end the business of white supremacy racism and let's go about doing that immediately. And I just have not seen evidence that a substantial number of whites are willing to divest from that. Have you anything to the contrary? No, I, I, don't, think, I don't think a substantial number of whites will do that. I think that some whites will do it, and I think that... Um, that it'll have an impact in some places, but you're right. I mean, a lot of times what happens is people check off, we did this diversity activity, and we, um, we're good. So I, I don't know what will happen, but um, uh, at a variety of different institutions, I'm, I'm happy about that. Is, is it enough? No, it's not enough. By the way, it's, it's, uh, it's, I've been on for an hour and 20 minutes. I have another call, so I'm going to have to go. Uh, do you have time to take one of our callers? We had uh, a few listeners dialed in with questions. Do you have time to get one before you go? Uh, yeah, no, 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 I can do that. I huh. can do that. I just have someone calling me. So. Oh, okay. Uh, Thomas in New York, did you have a quick question for Mary Beth Gassman? Yes, I did. Good evening. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, before I get to my question, Ms. Gaston, on, on, the, on the page, um, Gus has a picture of you with a black male. Is that your husband or is that a colleague? Oh, I don't know what the picture is. Um, let me, I think it let might me be see. from the it's TED not... Talk. I think it might be from the TED Talk. Uh, you're holding a glass. Oh, okay. Like... 
Yes. Okay. I see. Oh, I'm, ho- okay. I'm uh, holding just, a what? A glass. A glass with a beverage of some sort in it. Oh. Um. Oh. Okay. That's my, that's one of my really good friends. His name is. Uh, I think is. I think it's probably. Am I in a red dress with uh, black? Yes, ma'am. Black dress with red. Yes. Oh. Ma'am. Okay. So that's my friend Nelson Bowman. Um. He. Uh. And I have. Um. Written. Uh. Three books together, and uh, we were. Uh, Celebrating uh, one of the books. <laughs> so, all right. Well, being that we short of time, I'm gonna go to this question. Um, um, you did a lot of talk about your, your upbringing, and you were a very poor uh, white woman, and you know, came from a poor family, and you ended up going to an Ivy League school. Uh, who was your no, 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 I, no. I didn't. I didn't attend an Ivy League school. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you you teach at no. now? I, I assume. I do. Oh, okay. I do. Um, yeah, I do. Oh, you do. Okay. So you would know how to answer this. Uh, who do you think is more dangerous to non-white people, in your opinion? Is it the rich whites at your Ivy League school, or is it the poor whites that's, like, the ones that you grew up with, your father, et cetera? Well, you know, poor whites really don't have power. They, they, don't, they don't realize that, but they don't really have the same kind of power. Um, I mean, they have uh, the power that whiteness uh, give, gives you, but... They don't have monetary power and they don't have influence who have money and who have more education uh, have more of a stake in the dismantling of white supremacy. Um, I, I don't, I, I think like the individual kinds of acts come from poor people often and the um, systemic acts uh, come from uh, people who have more means and more education. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think if you have more means and more education, you probably can do more to foster white supremacy than you can if you are poor. That doesn't mean that if you're, you know, poor white that you can't um, uh, commit acts of individual racism, and you probably contribute to systemic racism as well. Hmm. Uh, did you have time for one more caller before you exit? I, I, I can do one more. I have someone calling me on the other line like crazy, but I'll do one more. All righty. Uh, she is our caller in Michigan. Uh, did you have a question for Mary Beth? You should be with us. I do. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. One question for the guest. Um, who do you feel is most ignorant or confused about racism, white supremacy, white people, or non-white people, and why? Okay, so who do I feel is most confused about white supremacy? Was that it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, white people. I, 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 think, I think that I wish that white people truly understood uh, white supremacy. I think, that, I think they know what it is, but I think uh, their lack of understanding is, where I see the lack of understanding is they don't understand their role in it, um, and uh, and deny their role. It's not necessarily that they don't understand. It's that they deny their role in it. So um, I think that uh, people of color know exactly what white supremacy is. I, I think they see it every single day, and uh, they know exactly what it is. Now, um, you know, I did mention that I think that whites know exactly what it is too, but they, I think they're in denial about their role in it. So that's where the confusion um, it's not a confusion that can't be, uh, you can get over that confusion easily by, you know, owning up to your role in white supremacy. Hmm. Hmm. I have to ponder on that for a moment. Oh, right on. I'll ponder on that for a minute. Uh, we had other, other folks, but perhaps we can, uh, get you back down the road so some of our other callers can get a question or two in. Seems like you'll probably be writing more on this subject, so we'll look out for more <laughs> of your essays in the future. Uh, again, she is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Mary Beth Gassman. Uh, several of her reports, you can check them out. They're linked in the description to the broadcast. Uh, thank you for sharing a bit of your Monday evening with us, and we'll look forward to speaking with you soon. Okay, thanks for the work you do. I appreciate it. For sure, for sure. Evening, Mary Take Beth. Mm-hmm. Bye. Evening, evening. Uh, context of white supremacy. Again, Mary Beth Gassman, uh, if you want to check out either of the articles that I was reading from uh, during the course of the evening, uh, they are both at the Washington Post. They are both linked in the description. Uh, the titles again, uh, an Ivy League professor on why colleges don't hire more faculty of color. 
We Don't Want Them. That was the first one that was published uh, about a month or so ago. Then the most recent one, just the last couple of days, uh, what, what people did when an Ivy League professor wrote, faculty of color don't get jobs because we don't want them. You can go check out uh, both of them. That last response was quite revealing particularly given what she said earlier and she even had to include it uh, where she had already said that whites that they are not ignorant about racism that they know how it works and things that they do to block black people from getting jobs and that sort of thing to then come back and say that whites are most uh, ignorant or most confused about racism that's the sort of malarkey that I mean and that's I can sum all of this up in a few words it's very important uh, the concept Zach Casey when he was on the program the impossibility of positive white identity uh, these sort of white people where they reveal a little nugget of truth uh, that even these folks we should not be jumping up and down and oh she is wonderful and she is great if we just had you know eight or ten more whites like her we could solve this problem. I do not agree. Um, that's great that she shared information, but it's the same stance that Mr. Fuller takes. We celebrate when this problem is solved. Uh, in my view, and I was even thinking, uh, if she had stayed longer, I could have gotten to this, but I had been thinking quite a bit about why would she even write this sort of essay, and particularly to have it republished in the Washington Post, which has a much broader uh, reading audience globally even. That's a pretty popular publication. Why would she write this sort of article? And uh, I just, I keep coming back. Uh, I'm not saying this is the sole reason or even the primary, but I do think it is important. The value of a quote unquote good white person that cannot be understated, uh, thinking that there are some whites who are not racist uh, or who are recovering racist. That's a term that was used in the second essay she had published, republished at the Washington Post. Um, that has a great value uh, to make sure that victims of racism, that we think not all whites are racist, that you got some good ones that are doing great work. You know, we got Timothy Wise and Jane Elliott and Peggy McIntosh and Mary Beth Gassman and some of the other, maybe even our guest for tomorrow, Patrick Phillips' book, uh, Blood at the Root. That is, is so huge because it gets so many non-white people where we do not have adequate suspicion. We do not have a correct understanding of what it means to be classified as white. Uh, it gets right to the core, and I've just seen, at least in my experience, where many, many non-white people, once we start thinking that, well, hey, Mary Beth is cool and Timothy Wise is cool, others have to be cool as well and or if they are not cool right now once we work with them and once we get them to the white privilege conference they will be cool they have the potential to be like Mary Beth that is huge and I think whites they understand the value uh, of having these types of representations even all the way back uh, when we were talking about the slave ship with Marcus Redeker uh, earlier this month or I think that was even last month uh, but he said even on the slave ship white enslavers, they understood the value of having a good white person. The Negroes might behave a little better, they might not try to revolt and kill us all if they think that there's at least one good white person. Um, the other part, I just, uh, <laughs> she kind of knocked it over at the end, but uh, that portion where she was saying that whites are not ignorant, I think that's very important. When she was kind of commenting at the end, that to me just sounds like what criminals do, deny their involvement in criminal activity. That's not confusion, that's not ignorance, that's standard criminal behavior. Of course, I'm going to lie. No, I don't know. What are you talking about? Money ended up in my pet. Those aren't even my pants. I didn't take anything. What are you talking about? Robbed a bank. I was in Hawaii while that bank was. What are you talking about? That's standard criminal behavior. Of course, I was not practicing racism. Of course, I didn't keep that nigger from getting a job. I don't know what you're talking. I, I agree. I'm with equality. I marched against the murder of Michael Brown and I voted for President Obama. I donated to his campaign. What are you talking about? Racist. That is standard white activity <laughs> to deny your involvement in racism. That's not ignorance. That's not confusion. That is the practice of racism right there. You're looking right at it. Uh, and I, I just think that that's, that's another one that we just have to get much better at uh, in terms of understanding hogwash when we see it uh, from individuals classified as white. The whole thing about her mom at the beginning, I think we did have some pushback there. And I will just, I will state again, uh, there are many, many folks over the years that we've been here who their conclusion is that Gus is a sexist, a patriarch, and he's just out there practicing misogyny and devaluing uh, women. 
fine if that's your conclusion. She can say all that about her mom being impoverished and having seven children. And no, I don't know what it's like to be a female. No, I don't know what it's like to have children. I contend a white woman, I wouldn't care if she was illiterate and had no school and had 20 children. If you are white in the United States, 1940, and I would even say 2016, you are in a much better position than a black person, period. Uh, we talked about it, and we're going to talk about tomorrow, no less, black people in Michigan in the 1940s. Now, she said her mom was born in uh, the 1930s, so she would have been there, I guess, a little a little further down the road. She said she was 48, so that would push her a little bit further down. But even if we're talking 1950s and 1960s, uh, your position as a black person in Michigan, wow, uh, where they had race riots uh, in Detroit about a few niggers trying to get a house. And, I mean, these are not race riots. These are white people going out and killing black people. Uh, in Detroit, we talked about before we had that book where there were thousands of white women Thousands of them who were working in the uh, automotive plants, uh, contributing and making products for World War II, where they went on strike. Thousands of white women went on strike because they hired a few black females to come and work low-level jobs in the factories during World War II, and they lost their mind. Are you serious? Do you think we're going to use the bathroom with these uh, nigger women? Are you serious? And they quit and wouldn't even work to support the war effort. That's what it is, the system of white supremacy. So I staunchly disagree. I understand any of us, we're going to protect our parents. Uh, I think she said her mom was in her 80s now, so I can understand any of us. You want to protect your parents and not have them thought of as racist. But I've heard that line. And for me, it's not even an indictment about her specific family. It's about that is a regular bit of rhetoric about white supremacy. I hear that consistently, and I'm sure some of our listeners could even testify to hearing people get on this program and say that white males, it was our white grandpappy or white father was racist, and he used to tell all kinds of nigger jokes and watch Sanford and Son or whatever it is, the Jeffersons. Our mom didn't agree with all that, and she used to tell us to be nice to everybody, and she was nice to black people, and she never said nigger, and she used to wag her finger at our father anytime he said nigger or made any racist comment. I've heard that before. Use your brain computer. That is not logical for things to work out that way consistently where these white women, just because they're victims of patriarchy and sexism and misogyny and white male patriarchy, that they're victims too, that they are just stuck with racist husbands and they just can't do, they just have to make do and just get by as best they can and they're not given access to jobs and salaries and things of that nature so they got to be, they got to go along with these racist oafs uh, just because that's what we got here. That is nonsense. <laughs> that, that is the practice of racism right there. Uh, these white women, you could not have a system of white supremacy without them. She mentioned those statistics about the teachers uh, in the United States. I think she said that uh, it was over 80% of them, uh, or I think 80% of them are white. In my view of the research we've heard before, about 70% of the teachers in the public school system are white females. They're not there as victims of patriarchy. In my view, they are there as willing race soldiers who are there for the detriment of black children in particular, non-white children on the whole. Uh, just to me, that is a major part of that pattern of seeing white women somehow as victims. They're not culpable uh, for the practice of racism. We just put all the blame on white males. Uh, and she can stick up for her mom and her family and give whatever you know, spin on it that she wants. I categorically reject that and would just ask listeners, have you seen that pattern? Does that make logical sense to continue to absolve these white women? And I just say, just on GP, general principle, I reject any sob stories from whites. I don't care what your story is about how bad your family had it. You didn't have a job. They didn't have any education. They had one tooth. You had to split a can of sardines uh, for two months uh, to live on. Wah, 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 wah. Cry me a river. Whites do that all the time in practicing victimization that somehow they had it really, really bad. You think those niggers had it tough. Woo, you haven't seen anything till you've seen our family. I've seen that consistently, and I have no sympathy. I was going to ask her about helping uh, white people because when she talked about that at the be uh, beginning, Asa Hilliard, prominent black scholar, uh, ancestor now, uh, when she talked about him and others uh, helping her, I was going to ask her about that as well, uh, that helping whites, uh, in my contention, 
those two things are related, us sympathizing with white people, uh, thinking of them as victims, even going back when we read Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela, where he has a section where he saw the white woman and she was bedraggled and eating fish bones and she was poor and he felt all bad for her. It's like, oh man, this is terrible. And then he stopped and was like, oh, wait a minute, I see destitute black people every day and I never feel bad about it. Those two concepts being related, the, the sympathizing, us being encouraged to sympathize and feel bad for whites if they have been hurt or if they're victimized somehow, that and helping white people. They are connected, they are related, they are an integral aspect of how this system is maintained. I would say just watch for that. Watch managing our emotions, watch for that. Uh, just note when you are being encouraged to sympathize with a white person for any reason, and if that's leading you to helping a white person, be on the lookout for both of those, because I think that's, that is a part of how our reflexes end up being contaminated in the system of white supremacy. I could be in error. Uh, sorry we didn't get to other listeners with uh, questions. I was trying to uh, switch in and get to the phone line. Uh, to get in some questions for our listeners, but just failed. Uh, at least we did get in Thomas in New York and uh, our female caller in Michigan. Uh, some of the other folks who dialed in, if you wanted to share either your observations or what question you would have asked, uh, feel free. I certainly wish I had asked before she departed about if uh, she was married to a white person, non-white person, or at minimum the father of her child, her daughter. Uh, if it was a white person or a non-white person, I was leaving that for listeners uh, to ask. I know that's a favorite one for Thomas and some of our others, uh, but I wish we'd got that in before she departed. Uh, folks who dialed in who did not get to ask uh, a question, uh, if you had uh, commentary or if you wanted to share what question you would have asked, uh, you should be with us. Feel free. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Can I be heard? Oh, somebody else spoke up, Gus? Oh, you could go ahead, Rob. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I had a, a couple of questions for her because um, at the end, she just turned out to be a liar like other white people. First, she, she like goes into this explicit explanation as to you know how much white people are not ignorant about racism and that if they try to tell you they are, that they're lying. And then at the end, she literally doubles back on everything she said. So to me right there, she just displayed her whiteness in rare form as usual. Um, I thought about when she talked about her father being a devout Christian and being so racist, I wanted to ask her, would she say that her father was practicing the religion of white supremacy, not the uh, religion of Catholicism, um, simply because that's the religion he practiced. Um, not, and that's not to say that uh, Catholicism itself is not racism, white supremacy. It absolutely is. But to me, the way she explained her father's uh, psychopathology, it looked more to me like his religion was white supremacy and he just threw a coating of uh, Catholicism on it to make himself look a certain way, I guess, to other white people. Um, so I just found that interesting. Also, um, when she talked about South Africa in regards to white people's fear of becoming a minority, she used South Africa as an example. And um, I don't know if you remember this, Gus, but a few months ago I sent you a picture. It was, a, 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 I mean, an article that had pictures of South Africa um, from a, that were taken from a drone that showed the poverty-stricken areas versus the rich areas, which all the poverty-stricken areas were white, I mean, were black, and all of the rich areas were white, and they were right alongside each other, and you can see the horrible disparity under which black people live right now. So, I, again, I thought she was practicing racism there, just bringing that up, simply because even though white people are not sitting in any president of that country or a prime minister, um, they're still in complete domination as if they never left. So I thought that that was an act of racism in and of itself. Um, I thought it was fascinating when she brought up the fact that um, her white, that white faculty are reminded about the atrocities visited upon blacks by being in their presence. Um, she had tried to, to me, um, again, practice racism. She was giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, I believe that they are reminded absolutely every time they see black people about those atrocities because it reminds them of their place of dominance and blacks place of subservience and they seek to reenact this dynamic every chance they get i wanted to um basically present that to her and then ask her um what what she thought about that because that is what i think about that i think yes every time white people come into contact with black people they automatically think about what they've done to black people so they can reenact that every opportunity that they get. And then also she said that um, white people need to dismantle white power and white privilege. I hate that term privilege. Um, and I wanted to ask her, um, what does that look like? 
since uh, she talks about uh, trying to pay forward what uh, Asa Hilliard, uh, Baba Asa Hilliard and all the other uh, black people who taught her, who she claims had an impact on her um, and facilitate facilitated her taking the path that she's taking as a so-called counter-racist, I wanted to ask her what the dismantling of so-called white power and white privilege looks like um, in a system of white supremacy and from her eyes as a white female. Um, and I just wanted to correct that um, Baba Asa Hilliard did not die in 2008. He died in August of 2007. I was actually in Egypt with Dr. Anoka Rashidi at the time when we got the news that he passed away. So I just wanted to correct that. And that's just for accuracy. Um, thank you, Nami Milan. Accuracy is important. Uh, were there other folks uh, who had comments? Uh, comments, or if you wanted to share what question you were going to ask? Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, she was interested. Um, I noted that she laughed at least 14 times. Um, and uh, she did mention fear quite a few times. So the question that I really wanted to ask is, That's something I'm really interested to know. It has to be a reason why they're doing what they're doing. And um, I noticed that every time someone gets close to asking somewhat of a question like that, they'll try to spin it, but they, they never uh, try to stay direct and uh, just be honest. And they're saying that they're going to be on the show, to be honest, but um, they'll get somewhat uh, honest. Well, the, the information really isn't honest. If they're not being 100%. So they'll, they'll give you a percentage of it, but then they'll renege on the rest. And um, I just always find that pretty interesting. And um, it always goes back to when she asked, uh, the, the, um, the other call asked who's most, most ignorant. And um, they'll say throughout the whole show that, uh, you know, white people are dedicated. They'll agree with what you say, but then they'll flip it at the end and say, oh, uh, well, they're ignorant. So. As I always say, man, these people are very interesting. You just have to uh, stay on top and watch their every uh, word because they're very tricky. Um, and I'll mute my line. Greetings, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Greetings, everyone. Uh, just something that, that I uh, notice, you know, pattern with uh, these uh, type of uh, suspected racist white people uh, is that uh, they understand the system of racism. That is a fact. And they understand it to the standpoint that they can trifle with non-white people, especially non-white black people who are suffering the most from the global system of racism, white supremacy, to whereas any white person that may be in their own personal lives, they lead a boring life, you know, a college professor, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm up to, uh, I'm up to uh, my ears with work that I celebrities. They may be on a smaller basis than what is done by technology, but they could be an instant celebrity, especially amongst black people, if they just write a phrase of some truth about racism and white supremacy. And for the most part, not anybody that I, that I hear for the most part on, on the cows, but the cows is like a tiny, tiny uh, minority of non-white black people. Uh, can become an instant celebrity with, with, with almost no method of questioning that that white person will f even feel uncomfortable of questioning this white person of their sincerity, let alone talking about uh, any, any uh, uh, desire to be effective. Uh, because my question would be, well, what are you going to do? Uh, it, goes, it goes to what... Uh, Mr. Joe Madison asks his, uh, his guests that come on this program, well, what are you going to do about it? And I put emphasis on do about it. You hear crickets in the background. You hear crickets in the background with this white person, or it, just, uh, it will become just a lot of yada, 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 and no substance behind it, you know, at all. Uh, the other thing 
uh, you know, a lot of times when I talk too long about one subject, I forget the, the other one. Uh, let me let me see if I can recall the other thing that I uh, was thinking about. Uh, oh, uh, well, she she mentioned about this example about her personal background. She must have haven't heard of the, the governor of the state of Florida, the present governor of the state of Florida, uh, uh, Richard Scott, uh, who who. Uh, uh, quote unquote, he brags about it. Grew up, grew up in poverty. Quote unquote, whatever the hell that means for a white person, uh, I don't know. I know it's different when it's a non-white black person. Uh, uh, grew up in uh, grew up in, in a uh, housing project, and, and uh, uh, he's the the governor of the state of Florida. He's a multimillionaire. You know, I mean, that story, like I think I heard you say, uh, is not uncommon amongst white people, and I don't care. I don't care, because non-white black people have, you know, that, 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 that kind of like, uh, you know, but nevertheless, you know, whether a white person is, is, uh, grew up in that type of situation, uh, whether they are uh, 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 sober or not, a lot, they still come out. A lot of examples, they still come out on the top of everything, despite whatever uh, obvious or not so obvious uh, infractions that they have in their life. And uh, those are just some of my observations. Thank you. Uh, other folks that uh, had, whoops, other folks that had uh, commentary that didn't get to ask a question, did you want to share your questions or observations? May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. Good evening, Gus, and to the callers and listeners. Um, my question for her was pretty much similar to the question that Roz asked and um, about uh, how making a statement that um, white people need to not just point out privilege, yep, that word, but they need to be dismantling it, and they need to be giving up things to dismantle their power. So my question for her personally was going to be, what did she do today to relinquish her power? And then I was going to ask her, when will she be powerless? Because I always think about that question that Ms. that, that uh, statement that um, Mr. Fuller says that if uh, white people really wanted to end the system of racism, white supremacy, they could do it in five minutes. By just ch- it could be a checklist. Okay, this is what we're going to do today to relinquish our power in area three. This is what we're going to do today to relinquish all our power in area eight. Um, so I was going to ask her what she did and um, to relinquish her power today and when she would be powerless. And like I said, kind of like what Ross was talking about, what does that look like, being powerless? Um, also, she used the term murky water twice in the context of white people having to deal with black students. <laughs> so I, I uh, took note of that. And um, yes, I agree with the caller in Firefighter in Florida when um, he says that uh, white people who are grew up poor, how um, we didn't have anything to do with that. And I'm very mindful of that every time that I uh, ride down this major street here in um, South Carolina and uh, there's um, these white people standing there with these signs begging or asking for money. And I, you know, say, you know, we didn't have nothing to do with that. That ain't got, that's, that's, that's not our problem. Too bad for you. Shame on you with that white skin and you let yourself get in that situation. Because had, if it was a black person standing there, they had everything to do with that situation. And I also have to um, exercise, I have to watch my anti-blackness when I see black people giving them money and kind of realizing that they're confused. Oh, uh, that brings me to my next question. Um, which um, I wanted to, um, I don't know if the call from Michigan is still on the line. I wanted to know if since she's been asking that question about who is more, who she, who she thinks 
who the guest thinks is more confused um, about racism, white supremacy, black people or white people. I wanted to know if she was taking a tally on the answers. And, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to know. Yeah, if she was taking a tally on the answers as to um, what white people are saying about uh who, how many white people think that white people are more confused? Because I haven't heard any of the white people on the program. I think maybe one man. It was so long ago I can't remember say that they believe that black people are more confused. So I don't know, if Gus, if you can recall a little more, but I wonder if she was taking a tally on that. I think that would be an interesting research project. Okay, that's all I had on in my line. Uh our caller in uh, Michigan, are you st still with us? At first, when I first started asking the question, I was taking a tally, but I just stopped because overwhelmingly from what I've heard, um, the majority of the white guests have said white people are most confused. Um, we, there was a um, person classified as Asian, if I'm not mistaken, she was from California, um, one of the guests that you had on. She's non-white, and she said um, non-white people are most confused. And I think there was just maybe um, maybe two or three other white guests that have said white people are, um, uh, non-white people are most confused. But it had gotten to the point where I noticed just overwhelmingly the white people are consistently saying white people are most confused. And tonight's guest was, she contradicted herself based off of what she said at the beginning and then how she responded at the end. So um, what I will do, though, I, I, I mean, I, I am interested, too, just having an accurate number. So I will go back and um, get a more accurate tally. That's something that I'm very interested in doing. I think Dr. Martin Kevorkian, and he's the last person I remember who said uh, he thought non-white people were most confused about racism. I think that was from this summer, maybe August, when he was on the program. Uh, but it's been very, and in fact, I think it's everybody, white people and non-white people, I think the vast majority, like 90% or more, uh, they say, oh, yeah, white people are most confused, uh, like with zest, no hesitation at all. Uh, let's see. Other folks that uh, we have not heard from, if you had commentary uh, you wanted to share, you should be with us. May I be here? Yes, ma'am. Um, hello to you, Gus, the host, and to the callers and listeners. The show is interesting, just a couple of things. You know, white people want to be everything. You know, <laughs> they're the most confused. They're the most confused, you know, they're the most of everything, you know, because I want to, you know, they want to be the victim. And I think, like you said, the last statement that she said that whites are more confused, but then, like you said earlier, she was talking like, you know, they know what's going on. So, you know, she kind of She made a statement about going somewhere and speaking somewhere, um, and she said it was like, what, 75% of the people in the room were white. And I guess she was really just giving it to them about the lack of, um, I want to say black, because I'm hearing black, more black people today talk about people of color, and I don't like that term when using black. So we'll say black and other people of color. And she said they stood up and gave her a standing ovation. And I just as I was just laying here listening to that, and I said, hmm, I said, it's just so funny. I said, because they at these schools where they, uh, according to her, they fight tooth and nail to keep from getting black faculty and faculty of color, yet to have a white person come in and speak to them and basically take them to task for that, you know, they're giving her a standing ovation. And that, to me, just still goes with the, um, it, for me, it just, even though it's not many of us in that room, but it just still, in my opinion, you add that all together to help keep black people in the state of confusion because if you have blacks who would see that who would tell well, oh yes 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 and it's just like but you know keep in mind you know many of the, the mass number of these professors are coming out of universities and colleges where 
like I said, they're fighting tooth and nail to keep from getting black faculty and um, other people of color faculty. So I, I just thought that comment that she made, I thought that was just very interesting. And it just, it just, it does go to show you, I mean, I don't know about white people. Anyway, that, that, <laughs> that was my comment. Thank you. I'll mute myself. That's fascinating. Uh, other folks that uh, we have not heard from, if you want to share your questions or observations. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I was going to ask her to explain some terms. Uh, I was going to ask her to explain or to define some terms to define comfort. Uh, she kept using it, especially at the beginning. Um, so that was... Uh, I thought that was, that was troublesome. <laughs> I also wanted to ask her why she kept on her daughter, like repeatedly, instead of answering your question. I thought that was um, very, very suspicious. And also I wanted to ask her to define the term friends. Um because if she, cause she, um, she accepted or she agreed with your definition of racism and supremacy, so I was just wondering, like, so could she have non-white friends? So that I thought that was uh, very suspicious as well. And just like the other callers, I was going to ask her about poverty. Like, what does that really mean? If she agreed with your definition, then that term really has no true meaning or value. So um, that's that's what I was going to ask her. Um, give or take my call. Interesting. That uh, comfort, her deviating to the daughter, I thought that was important too. The laughter as well, I noted that also. It was lots of lots of giggling kind of from the very beginning of the broadcast. Uh, other folks, that anybody that we have not heard from, do you want to make your observations or ask what questions you were going to ask uh, Professor Gassman? Anybody that we missed, anybody who has not shared, who has a hand up, who has not commented at all? May I be here? Yes, ma'am. Greetings, everybody. Um, thank you for this show. And I always love it. Like, I get really excited when um, a white woman is here on the show because I can, I like, I'm just looking to see what she does. So they pretty much follow the same um, script. She didn't get all offended and everything like that, but she did do a lot of the same things that some of the other white women have done. At one point, you asked her um, if you thought, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, if you, if she thought that white people would willingly give up their power or stop being racist and abusing and mistreating us? And her answer was, and then what I want to ask is then, what do white people think we're going to do? Or what does she think that we should do? Or, you know, pretty much what's your, what next then? If white people aren't going to give it up, then what? You know, and I think she might have said something, well, you know, along the lines that it takes time and uh, how you start in, like, certain sectors or something like that. But that doesn't necessarily really work for me because that's like we've been doing that and that we've tried a lot. So if white people, and a few other white people have answered this question. I don't remember who and in what show, but said something to the effect of, no, they didn't see white people stop, you know, stopping being racist and ending racism white supremacy. Um, so then really what do they think is going to happen and that this is just how we're supposed to live in forever and that a few of them can get famous and all of that because we look at them as, you know, some Jesus Christ savior or something like that. And then so that's my next question. I guess my only question, do you, it's the white people, do y'all see ourselves in it? If the answer is no, then what, what y'all expect you're supposed to do, just keep doing this and having the conversation? Um, but then the other thing that I've been kind of paying attention to when it comes to these white women specifically is, you know, I don't know about her background, so I'll go ahead and say that. I don't know her, anything like that. But I'm really tired of what I consider to be white people's rejects 
pretty much becoming famous and getting all this love from us. Like, that's how I feel. You know, she's like, oh, well, you know, I don't really deal with the white people. They looked at me like I was funny or whatever it is. You know, I don't know if she mentioned that, but other white women have, and I kind of got that feeling from her that, you know, I'll just go be cool because black people treat me way better than white people do, you know. And if her story is true and she grew up, you know, the way she says with an illiterate mom or whatever and the 10 kids and the one, you know, whatever, then I could see maybe that she would have been on, like, some outskirt or something and was not one of the cool white girls. Um, And so then she just found her place with us. And I was really frustrated with that because, of course, we have self-hatred and all that stuff, so we're not very kind and compassionate and loving to all. I don't know if she even considers that her even being around us like that is racist. You acting like like getting all this love from us and all this validation from us and all this support from us is you benefiting from racism, is you taking advantage of racism. Um, and so that those, you know, I, I would have said that to her. That would have been my comment. And then my other question was, well, what y'all expect me supposed to do? Thank you for taking my call. Y'all have a comment. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, we had two people wrote in uh, the one question this person wrote in to ask. Uh, can you ask the Miss uh, Mary Beth Gaspin? Can you ask her? Uh, does she believe there's a difference between ethnic racial identity versus racial assignment? Additionally, is it power and privilege that makes those assignments? Uh, his observation was that using logic, how can a white person be ignorant about the practices they use intentionally, knowing that it will impact black people greatly so that they don't reach their goal? She authored an article on the premises of white institutions not hiring black Ph.D. candidates to teach at their schools. More confusion. Uh, he ends it by saying Mr. Fuller has stated that these people, whites, are the most familiar mystery. Absolutely. Uh, other person uh, wrote in. Uh, he wanted to ask her uh, if we got a chance to ask her, does she think feminism benefits uh, black females? And if so, how? Uh, and continued by saying um, the way she chooses to focus on people of color versus black people and the hierarchy of mistreatment is a racist act. I mean, she immediately differentiated gender. Uh, from white when speaking about her mother so isn't not doing that when speaking on racism and ignoring the placement of black people versus other races or mistreated peoples an act of racism uh, that's something I thought was important as well particularly for even though she was not doing it but many 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 other white and non-white people when they talk about white supremacy and they say blacks and browns or uh, feel some need to not just you know say black people are harmed they have to include all these other folks uh, and even sometimes it'll extend to white women and gays and a whole lot of other stuff uh, i think it's very important to be upfront. Uh, black people are most mistreated and that's even why in her article where she points that out where she says when she got this torrent of responses over a thousand nasty responses people making all these excuses about how dumb and ignorant black people are and they don't deserve these jobs and you know she's a no count white woman for writing this trashy article she said that it was exclusive focus on black people. They weren't on there, you know, talking bad about Latinos or Asians or any other group of non-white people. It was exclusively black people. And that's exactly the same thing that uh, the book Two-Faced Racism uh, by Leslie Pika, uh, the co-authors Leslie Pika. Uh, she was not a guest on the on the program uh, but Dr. Joe Fagan, the other co-author, was a guest on the program in 2010, and he said the data, when whites, these were white students, they would write down any time that they experienced racism or they observed racism being practiced, um, they would write it down, and they said every time that it was some sort of racist joke or racist comment, it was overwhelmingly focused on black people. Uh, that hierarchy in the system of white supremacy, that should be called out, and I think any of those uh, times where we're just kind of throwing everybody together as though it's all the same, uh, that it's just not true. Uh, we want accurate information, and that that is accurate, uh, looking at the t uh, statistics, looking at the evidence. Uh, black people are treated worse. Uh, and that should be, you know, explicitly stated often as possible. Make that clear. Um, do we miss anybody? Uh, any, anybody else that did not get a chance to ask their uh, question or get their <clears throat> observations in? 
May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello, Gus, and all of, all of the callers. I wanted to ask her, um, does she think that, I mean, because we are in a system of racism and white supremacy, so does she think that they were doing that on purpose to discourage black people from pursuing degrees, um, PhD degrees? I wanted to ask her, um, I don't know how I would have worded this. I, I, I go with the last caller. The last caller said that it's kind of like the reject deal with some of these white people. Um, they, or they'll be just, you know, how white people really feel about fat people. They don't really like them, so they'll kick them out, and then they'll come over to our side, and they'll be they'll be loved, they'll be received with love. And I'm, I had a question about that, and I also was going to ask her, because she seems like she was ready to do all she could for black people, and I was going to find out, I was going to ask her to send me and my family an Asa Hilliard um, book. I was going to ask her to donate that to my family. And um, and that that's those are my questions for her, but she got off the line. Okay, thank you. Um, that would have been interesting if she would have been willing to queue up with some uh, literature, Asa Hilliard uh, literature. Um, do just the important distinction. I think uh, the Tubby Whites, I don't think they get kicked off the racist team. I think they just will get ridiculed because whites do mistreat other whites. Racists do mistreat other racists. Uh, it's just they can get uh, more love and attention and affection from black people. Uh, I think that's just a slight difference in making sure we're not uh, suggesting that they have been kicked off the racist team because that isn't the case. It's just they can go and, hey, I don't have to be ridiculed by other racists. I can go hang out with these niggers and they'll just love me uh, and think that I'm great and, you know, help me get things done. And uh, I think we've had a lot of uh, whites who've kind of been in that position on the program before, particularly white females uh, who are a little overweight or have been abused. Uh, particularly if they've been mistreated uh, by other whites, often white men. If we're talking about white females, uh, white women, uh, I think we've had quite a few uh, whites who've kind of fit that pattern on before. And they can come hang out uh, amongst the Negras and get all kinds of adulation and what have you and feel much better about themselves, boost their uh, white self-esteem, uh, and practice racism, white supremacy in a really refined way where they control how all these other uh, black people think about them, and that has a huge impact on how they, those victims, think about racism, think about whites in general, uh, just the presence. And I think some of the listeners pointed that out, just her presence being around other black people in that manner, uh, being a, a way that whites practice racism, uh, which I think is really important as well. Can't be understated the the impact that these whites have on the individual whites that they come in contact with, and I would even submit uh, whites. I mean, excuse me, non-whites who uh, are reading her reports, reading her books, uh, seeing her videos, and what have you. She has a TED talk. Just seeing her present in this way and thinking, "Oh, this is a cool white woman." That that has a huge impact that should not be uh, taken for granted. Uh, Do we miss anybody? Didn't miss anybody. Grand, grand. Uh, folks have any other comments they wanted to make sure they got in? Maybe we heard yeah. Hello? The, uh, caller in Ohio, go ahead. Okay, just one quick thing, Gus, and I just wanted to tell you this. I don't know if anybody ever told you. As lately, I've been listening to your show, and like you can be talking, and it goes out for maybe well, three or four seconds, and then it comes back in. You know, I don't know. I just wanted to uh, mention that to you. Thank you. I don't know if there's something going on, you know, with Black Talk Radio or what, but I just wanted to mention that so you could check that out. Thank you. Somebody did. I don't think it's a Black Talk Radio thing, but I have not uh, figured it out completely. I thought I had fixed it because I didn't hear it yesterday, uh, but then I, I heard it today, so I'm not, I'm still ignorant trying to figure out, solve that problem. All right. Just want to let you know. Thank you. I'll mute myself. Copy her? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so I've noticed the same thing. It's been going on for like two weeks. 
um, you'll be in the middle of saying something, and then it just cuts off, and I kind of open my phone to see if I drop the call, but then I hear your voice, and I'll miss a part of what you were saying. But I kind of put two and two together and figure it out. Um, I did have other questions for her. I didn't, you know, want, I wanted to give other people out. I was hoping that you could sneak a few in. Um, and um, the caller in Michigan, um, she asked that question, um, and it's a great question because I think it's very revealing. And I can't remember one time where a white person has answered her question by saying that black people are more ignorant. I do remember the Asian lady Um, she was she had a very good understanding of the concept of racism, white supremacy, although I did think that she was involved with a white male, but she did uh believe during that show notice that it was wrong and at some point, you know, she ended that relationship she indicated. But um, I wanted to know, since she was so detailed at that opening the opening on I guess the talk Ted's talk, um, in talking about this issue. I wanted to um, talk about her father um, and, you know, just explaining so much about him. I just would have guaranteed that she could have remembered some racist jokes he might have had, and I wondered if she would have shared them with us. Um, and I wanted to hark back on her mother. Um, I wanted to know an example of her mother maybe practicing racism that she looked back on of course, she wasn't going to come out and just say something that her mother did. But um, just something, you know, if, if I could just wanted to get her to say something small, you know, clutch her pocketbook or something. And I also want to know how did she practice racism herself? Um, and you asked her the question, but I just think that she was very vague in her answer. She kind of obfuscated to answer something else. Um, my personal opinion of her is... um. She was a very refined racist, as most of the professors are in these major institutions. Um, they come straight from the critical whiteness studies, and um, that's what the formation of white privilege comes out of, um, something called critical whiteness studies. And um, that's taught, I, I, I believe they train people in the major institutions to take on that theory of white privilege um, through these critical whiteness studies. And I think that um, that was pretty much, the, the, that's pretty much the norm um, when speaking to these people from these major universities, especially the Ivy League ones, um, is that they have that same white privilege ideology, just the way she described everything. Even in describing her father at the beginning, it was sort of, uh, even though he was doing these things, he was ignorant. He didn't know any black people. She was making excuses for him. Like, you know, he was just you know, a racist like that, you know. So I just think that um, that's a big thing that they teach at these universities. Um, unfortunately, they teach it to black people, too. And a lot of black people come with that same view. And um, I just think it's atrocious. I mute my line thinking. Can I hear it? Yes, sir. Uh, greetings to you guys. Um, yeah, I, I was going to chime in too. That is that is true. Um, you have dropped out intermittently um, during some of the shows while you were in the middle of speaking. Um, so yeah, hopefully we get to find out what that is and we can get that rectified. That comes out fine on the um, on the recording. It's just actually during the live show. Um, and I don't know if it's only happening for people who are calling in versus people who might be on Skype or. Um, listening to Black Talk Radio Network, but for me, I call in directly, so um, so I don't know if it's only for us or for everyone. Um, also, I just wanted to chime in on her mother, and um, I just when when white people bring up the poverty thing, it really like makes me laugh, simply because to me, a poor white person is just a waste of white flesh. I don't know how you could be white and not you know not be able to make something happen for yourself. The way white people uh, take care of and look out for one another. That is laughable. And anytime I see white homeless people, I just say, oh, waste, waste of, of white skin. Pretty much, you're a waste. You're literally a waste. 
um, because that white skin should be a ticket to any and everything that you want in this life. Um, so I found that uh, hilarious. What I found too is that um, white people can be poor. I've I've been around some of the, the some of the poorest white people that I've ever been around. I've been around homeless white people. I've been around so-called mentally ill white people with Down syndrome, and every last one of those sons of guns practice racism. So um, you know her her just using the fact that her mom had ten kids. Your mom used to close her legs. She comes from that era before um, abortion was made legal. And if you just from that uh, Maafa 21 documentary, you interviewed the um, the guy who made that movie that prior to, to abortion becoming legal, that white women were the poster children for um, making babies at a young age. So her mother fell into that category. She should have closed her legs and maybe she wouldn't have had 10 kids to have to stay with a racist because I think that's what she wanted to do. They try to use that to uh, use poverty as some means to connect with black people. There is no connection there. There's nothing that we have in common except that you are a terrorist and an abuser and we are the abusee. That's the only relationship that you'll ever have with black people. Then the other aspect where she kept bringing up her daughter and especially the story she told about the black male who cried because they saw her, her daughter wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt and there came the Jesus Christ syndrome. I wanted to just straight Earl as soon as I heard her say that. My stomach started churning. And it's just so sickening that we have been conditioned to accept these, um, these cosmetic visual uh, behaviors of so-called counter-racist behavior, like wearing something as simple as the Black Lives Matter T-shirt that you can just take off, throw in the trash or throw in the washing machine, and then go right back outside and practice racism. So none of these things mean a thing to me. Um, I think she was a highly refined racist, just like Thomas in New York said. Um, I think that she tries to use uh, people like Baba A. Sahili and these other people as a means to um, really bypass the, uh, the alarm bells that should normally come off in the psychology of black people whenever white people like her come around. I think she's just a, one or two steps away from being Sue Europe. Um, as far as her approach to black people and her ability to function around black people in a manner in which we don't see and we think that there's such a such thing as a good white person and especially a female. Um, so that's my take on that. And um, I would like to have her back on because I would like to ask those questions and I would really like to ask her if she spent any time in, um, in relationships with black males or females uh, simply because I, I could easily see um, some black person being fooled into thinking she's some worthwhile person to deal with. And again, a lot of times I've seen uh, sadly, and this is, seen black people deal with the most hideous of white people and she's pretty hideous so i wouldn't be surprised if there was some black person who was so fooled into thinking that um you know jesus in the form of mrs gasman had something wonderful to do for them and change their life uh thank you and i'll meet my line can i be heard can i just uh, there were people that just got on the line the caller at four two four three and eight nine five zero did y'all have commentary um, I just had a quick comment. Mm -hmm. The term diversity or diverse a lot. I feel like that is definitely, it seems like that's like a poster term for the, for like a suspected white supremacist or white people in general to use that term just to let us know, well, it wasn't just us. It was, we did allow, you know, some other people, whether it be black people or people of color. So, I just thought that was interesting. That's all. May I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, uh, I'm Josh from Michigan. Uh, just calling in to say, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, pretty much what everyone's been saying, especially about wanting to know if she was involved with uh, any so-called black males or any so-called black females or just any non-white person in general. And uh, the fact that she's totally flopped at the end and she said, well, I think white people are more confused, even though they know, like, her entire response was just nonsense. I didn't understand it and, and wish she could have stayed on, so she could have got interrogated about that. And uh, what the caller was just saying a few a few callers ago, what they were saying about how um, the whole, uh, well, my mom was poor and, you know, she was abused and blah, blah, blah. Um, just even, even the term white trash, like, just thinking about what that word, um, what that phrase means. Like, if other white people who aren't poor aren't trash, you know, 
then that means that they are smart enough to know how to exploit non-white people to gain something, to gain wealth, to gain anything. But white people who are poor, they're, they're trash. You know, they, they couldn't figure it out like, like, like the rest of the white people could. So just, yeah, th- that, that whole thing. And, uh, I really, I recently got into a discussion with a non-white black male about, you know, racism, and white supremacy. And it, it just seems like a lot of us are confused because he just says, uh, my definition of racism does include that all white people are racist ultimately. And you just couldn't agree with that because, you know, uh, just, just saying, because not all white people have power or they don't have the same amount of power. And I think, uh, uh, do, do you, do you have any, any, uh, who uh who say things like that well like there's some poor white people too and they they got it just as bad or when i was when i was growing up we we had more money than the white trash down the street and they they had nothing but we at least had such and such you know that that whole thing um and i'm in my line that's it uh can i be heard again yes sir uh Yes, I, I think the uh, the question, uh, who, under the system of racist white supremacy, who's the most confused, white people or non-white people, is a very, very important question. I'd uh, like to encourage the, uh, the participant from Michigan to continue with her questions. And just like what she said, uh, it's not even close of the, uh, in my opinion, the incorrectness uh, to whereas, uh, without me even having to keep score, uh, uh on that behalf, I, it, it just overwhelmingly, in my opinion, is incorrect. Most, most people, uh, say it is, uh, white people, though, uh, and I'm talking about white people and non white people and non white people who are black that says that white people are more confused. Uh, but I think on the, on the behalf of non white black people, uh, it's for different reasons. It's for a different reason. I think because non-white people are confused on the global system of racist white supremacy, and most of us don't have a personal meaning that's logical to racism. That we're automatically, in a lot of cases, going to say uh, white people because it because the the advent of us being victims of racist white supremacy is not too complimentary. It's not, uh, it's not a situation that boosts your ego uh, to admit that you are uh, subject to someone who is mistreating you based on color. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that is, that's probably one of the, that's also one of the, one of the attributes uh, to it. people can tell you based on some experience they may have had uh, due to racism, like, hey, you know, I just got stopped by the police for no reason, uh, 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 that sort of thing. But that doesn't mean that you, you are, 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 are uh, focused on racism, what it is and how it works. Whereas white people, as I've heard several people mention, have to have an understanding of, of white supremacy. They have to have an understanding of white supremacy on a daily basis, so they, they're certainly not they're certainly not confused on it. Uh, they may be in a particular order of things, whereas it's not very pertinent for uh, uh, a, a, a a white person to have the uh, the the the, uh, the power that particular level of power of some other white people. <coughs> excuse me, has but. They all have an understanding of racism. Uh, and logic would tell you, uh, uh, t- tell you the difference between white people and non-white people also on that subject. So it was just a thought that I had on it when, that's, when that comes up as far as the difference between the, re- the, the answer <coughs> that, that uh, non-white people give as opposed to white people. Thank you. Um. I just wanted could I I just wanted to share that she she seemed so so happy. It was she was just so happy like throughout the talk no matter what type of question it was or how 
however, like the context was, she was just happy. I mean, I heard other people, you know, talk about her giggling, but she was just elated at at herself, at everything. So I think the the female caller was talking about how these people and the caller from Florida, these people become like celebrities. I think she's just like a really happy celebrity. She was just, I would just contrast like listening to her compared to like Neely Fuller or Francis Cross Wilson or some of the other callers where, I mean, there's no, there's no, there's, there's just reality, there's no happiness, but she was just so ecstatic. Like the whole, Have you heard? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, reference the caller who asked about, um, you know, how some black people will position poor whites and look into them as being um, someone someone that, that they can empathize with. Or, and, and I would just say um, to, to a black person that brings that up to me, I often um, go back to this being a system. And um, like all systems, it needs to be maintained, you know. So they might not be the people that created the system. Those would be the, the more elite whites. But um, the daily maintenance of the system is all white people. Um, poor, rich, all of them are in charge of maintaining the system and keeping it functioning um, optimally um, and codifying it so it could change with other changes that happen in society. They just change it alongside with it. And I think that poor whites are just as um, are just as important to this system being the way it works as white women are. You know, just how they try to to obfuscate the white woman to say, oh, you know, it's the man. Um, it's no way. You know, and, and um, when people say that to me, I often say, you know, have you ever seen um, a crackhead that wasn't married to another crackhead? I mean, it's just it's it's usually. If that's what your wife does, that's what you do. Um, that that's pretty much the way I look at it, and um, I w- I would think that they would have to be looked at. That female would have to be looked at as being just as dangerous as that white man. If that white man is displaying um, overt actions of racism, you have to expect that that wife condones that action. I'm your mom. Folks, have uh, any other comments or any thoughts on why uh, these particular art? Where I guess it would be the first one about how whites keep black faculty members out of white institutions. Any thoughts on why that essay became so popular? Um, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I think the reason it became popular can campaign white validation. We have been so conditioned to worship our enemy and to think that when any one of them says anything that even remotely sounds like it could be counter racist, we feel immediately endeared to them. Almost every wall that we've ever put up in regards to how we've been systematically mistreated by these people, it drops. And, you know, you get the the Jesus Christ, Tim Wise, uh, Sue Europe, uh, treatment where they just get the adulation and, oh my gosh, they're saying what I wanted them to hear, but I mean, what I've been trying to get other white people to see my whole life. And, you know, this whole, the whole thing is predicated on us being fooled, which goes back to the brilliance of Dr. Marimba and me, rhetorical ethic. I think that is the thing they have mastered most effectively. They are the most Machiavellian creatures ever, and that is what they use most effectively against our people and all of the non-white people is to give us the impression that they are something that they're not. And then what happens is, is exactly what you say regularly. They can show you better than I can ever tell you. And that's what happens to us every time. I believe that's one of the linchpin reasons as to why we have not solved this problem. And they have have been so successful for the last 500, but actually the last 6,000 years, because we, the first documented contact we have with them goes all the way back to Kemet. So the whole idea is they've mastered this over so many generations that we now have to master countering that. And I think that is one of the biggest problems that we've had, um, period, just non-white people. We've had that problem, um, and that problem, I think, is the lasting issue that stops us from shifting our behavior collectively towards a counter-racist uh, collective manner to shut down the system. Thank you. Baby Yes, sir. 
uh, I, I sort of, I, I agree with the previous caller that, you know, we just, just got to give white people all sorts of validation when they say anything about racism. And I also think maybe, maybe she was sending it out like sort of codified messages to other white supremacists that it's time to refine even more. So it could have been just an article disguised as we need to help these poor non-white people. Messages to other codified white supremacists who would not get upset with her for writing such an article, but would, uh, but would get it and tighten up the news a little bit more or close, cl close the gates a little bit more. Cause you know, I think when Obama gets out of office, it's it's about to go. I mean, it's already been going down. It's, it's a war. But I think when Obama gets out of office, the next 15, 20 years, it's, it's going to be just further, further, steeply more downhill for, for all of us, especially non-white so-called black people. So I think she just sent out messages to other white supremacists to 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 get their act together and, and to prepare for these people coming in. I'm in my line. Yes. Um when a white person sends out these tidbits of information and they become instant celebrities and mind you at very little risk of anything happening to them by other whites. Uh, I have never heard of this, of article similar to this, uh, 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 so and so, uh, white female or, or white male, uh, says, uh, something and, uh, someone hotwired their car for explosive or they, they were assassinated, uh, for us, <clears throat> make, uh, making this tidbit information, uh, about racism. Uh, very little risk that's involved. And, and the white people who actively, have the most power and it's practicing racism on a daily basis. They're not even concerned about a person like her, uh, uh going to even, uh, uh come in to uh, disrupt the meetings that they have to be able to accomplish the task of not allowing non-white people to, uh, be employed at these institutions. They're not going to disrupt these meetings or, or anything like that. Even pour coffee on the on the paperwork. They're not, they're not even worried about that at all. Not even from a remote standpoint. And that's why. As uh, well, he's well, he or she is kind of crazy. I can remember them saying that about John Brown. There was something wrong with his mind, and he actually went out and killed other white people. You know, just just missed it. Just dismissed it at at that. And these, these, this, this numerical tiny, tiny number of white people who call themselves counter racist, it doesn't even factor. It doesn't even factor into anything that is constructive. That's my thoughts on, on the question that you asked. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Ken Steele, Ken Steele, did you have commentary you were going to share? Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, um, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Perfect. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, beware of these stories or um, confessions from suspected white supremacists. Uh, I suspect that these are just um, status reports. Uh, they just kind of want to let everybody know that everything is going according to plan, that everything is working just fine, and that nothing is going to be done to stop uh, what is occurring. Um, I think that a lot of this work uh, to that they claim is to counter racism, I suspect is just uh, to make it better, to make it so that they're better able to practice it calm uh, certain black people down, to confuse black people um, or non-white victims of racism and white supremacy that are classified as black specifically. Um, and honestly, uh, I, I wanted to um, uh, piggyback off of what uh, Thomas from New York said earlier. 
uh, I, I believe he remarked uh, that. Uh, man, sorry about that. I, I lost my train of thought. I'll mute my line here, um, and uh, I think I'll have something to contribute a little bit later. Thank you. For sure. Happens to the best of us. Blame that on racism, white supremacy as well. <laughs> Even though I, I snickered, I am being serious about that. The trauma of racism does have an impact on how well uh, your, uh, our cognitive abilities, uh, our cognitive abilities to function and process information are adversely impacted by white supremacy racism. So not so funny. Uh, any other comments folks want to make sure they get in uh, before we wrap things up again? We'll be here tomorrow. Uh, Patrick Phillips, Blood at the Root racial cleansings per he uses that exact term purge in forsyth county uh georgia and getting rid of all of the niggers the threadbare lie that a black person uh raped a white woman uh now we have to kick out all the black people but that'll be tomorrow 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific very enjoyable book uh other comments folks yeah i i just wanted to say yeah um that uh the white studies uh or critical whiteness studies that go on in these schools. I recently had an encounter with a PhD uh, from one of uh, these major institutions in Texas. Uh, and this person was on one of, uh, commenting on one of my uh, status updates. And it was regarding Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I asked this PhD on critical theory uh, what his definition of racism was. And I suspect that these people are teaching uh, non-white people that there is no definition of racism and that it cannot be defined. And this person specifically said as such. And I think that they are they are studying critical theory in one of these schools and uh, they are a PhD and a dean at one of these schools uh, that they are uh, disseminating this information down the line. So I... I pretty sure that they are deliberately teaching non-white people that there is no functional definition of racism. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. Can I be heard? Oh, okay, okay. Um, I just wanted to get one last thing in. Um, since I've been studying racism, white supremacy, and it's been quite a long time, that white people are functionally mentally ill and diabolical because I don't think uh, you can do the things to other people that white people have done to all non-white people and not be psychotically mentally ill. But I believe that psychotic mental illness is when white people are in a state of homeostasis. I also believe that not being able to practice racism is when whites become non-functionally ill, meaning that acting in a way that promotes justice makes white people sick because the only way they know how to function is racist and unjust. And that is due to their fear of genetic annihilation. Thank you. Hmm. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Hey guys, do, uh, do you ever remember recall a white guest um, ever chiming in and mentioning genetic annihilation in their, um, in their analysis of racism? Uh, I know there have been whites who have agreed, um, saying that they think that that is logical, that's reasonable when they've been presented. I don't remember if any have, like, volunteered it before being asked. Um, I don't have to think about that a little bit. Okay, and then um, I heard someone say renege earlier. Is that in the word guide? I'm at my mother's house. I don't have my, my word guide with me. Um, I'm not at my residence right now, so I don't have my word guide, uh, in front of me right now to recall if Renig is in there or not. Uh, I might be leaning towards saying no, but I'm not at the residence, so I can't check. If anybody has their word guide handy, uh, and you want to check really quick to see if Renig is in the word guide, let us know. Retired yeah. firefighters on the way. Oh, okay. Right on. Right on. The only act. Because I know the uh, only way, the only time I've ever used that word was um, playing spades. And, you know, you go over 
you know, you overbook, overbid, or, or, or you, um, if you cut a card and you still have the suit, you know, you renege, you know, we take away three books, or I think it might have been two books, we take away from you for doing that. And I thought it was interesting that the word nig is in there. Right, right. I don't know if it, I guess we'll find out in a second or two, but I do know Mr. Fuller has commented that <clears throat> many of the terms that have that neg sound in it, close to nigger, uh, that they are something foul or uh, something bad, uh, negative, uh, negation, uh, reneg, uh, that quite a few that have that uh, prefix, the N-E-G prefix, uh, it's for, you know, oh man, calamity, catastrophe, or uh, something, uh, minimization, something being minimized. He does watch out for that, but I don't know if he includes renege in the word guide. I'm looking at the word guide. Um, I'm on 336. Mm -hmm. It goes from remedial education, and then it goes to report. I don't, I don't think renege is in the word guide. Yeah, I didn't think it was. Didn't think it was. Doesn't mean, you know, if you come to your own conclusion that you want to try to avoid those terms that have that neg in it, N-E-G, and it's going towards something uh, adverse, negative, as I said, neg uh, negate, uh, renege, then certainly I, I see the logical sense, and I know Mr. Fuller has verbally addressed that before, even if it's not in the way. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. I believe uh, that suspected white supremacists also have a term, niggardly, which apparently is not nigger, but it means uh, acting bad, uh, acting cheap, uh, acting uh, uh, disingenuous. It's basically, uh, I guess, acting like um, niggardly. I, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm remiss to find any other uh, meaning, but they allege that it is not the word nigger. Think. Niggardly. Yeah, we, I think we talked about that one before. Stingy thinking, stingy minded. I know I've heard Mr. Fuller talk about that specifically where he says, because uh, the definition for niggardly is not generous, stingy. Uh, and he says that that's the way that they groom, contaminate black people to function, uh, to have a very small perspective uh, on the world that you're not we're not going to be generous with our resources so you will have a very small limited way of thinking uh, that's in that term and I know niggling is another one like uh, these are little annoying tasks that you don't want to do or participate in niggling duties that's another one they have lots of those terms so yeah if you want to excuse eliminate those words from your vocabulary that is cert I certainly understand the logic of that Uh, any final comments before we uh, wrap things up? We'll prepare to be back uh, tomorrow. Eight consecutive days of broadcasting, preparing for many more as we'll be on every day for the remainder of the week. Anything else folks need to get in before we wrap things up? Five seven seven one. did you have a comment? Five seven seven one. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Hi, uh it, it was interesting you guys talking about uh, the word nig and uh, listening to, I think it was Thomas and you talking about spades. Uh, sounds like a Welsing moment to me, even though I never you know, heard her say it or, or read anything about it. But spades and, and renig sounds, you know, very much, uh, you know, like something Dr. Welsing would, you know, you know, uh, put together. But uh, in regards to the article uh, in education, What's interesting is, even though this is getting a lot of attention, there's not enough attention being put on uh, black teachers in the elementary and high school levels being shut out, which I think is even more important. I mean, I've personally known people uh, within the education sector who have been denied jobs, you know, due to, due to, due to racism, white supremacy, and probably one, of the re probably one of the number one reasons why the public school system, especially in a lot of uh, a lot of major cities where they're predominantly non-white people, uh, are failing. So uh, it's interesting uh, how the uh, the shutout of black teachers, especially male teachers, 
uh, within districts uh, where there are majority black people uh, within the public school system. And it's not, to me, it's not getting in. And what I, which I think, you know, white institutions on the college level have been racist, you know, since their inception. So, you know, it's really no, you know, secret at all, but. Yeah, it seems like the uh, on the uh, elementary school and, and, and high school levels, uh, it, it, it's much more damaging because you know that's the time where you know young kid, you know young children are, are are being educated and molded to the person that they're probably going to be, you know, for the rest of their lives. So uh, that's all for a minute, and I'll meet my line. Doctor Travis Bristol. Uh, we did do a, I was just going to say, we did do a program on that as well. Dr. Travis Bristol, black male, he's at Stanford University. He had a report, I think, that was also republished in the Washington Post uh, titled The Disappearance of Black Male Teachers, where he talked about that specifically at the K-12 through uh, level uh, and how racism is at the root of a lot of that, uh, where black, we're just not having as many uh, black male teachers. In fact, their numbers are dropping uh, more so than anybody else but we just talked about that i think it was the end of 2015 dr travis bristol and i asked him specifically about that question about white females being at the core of the school to prison pipeline he vigorously disagreed but anywho thomas in new york yeah i was just going to say man 84 percent of the people who get up to teach our kids are white and um these are the people that's supposed to be teaching our kids to compete with white people in the future for jobs and opportunities so to me it's it's no it's, I mean, it's a no-brainer why they, our kids are failing and those schools are no good. I mean, there's no way I would get up and teach white kids to be better than my black kids. It's just not going to happen. So, um, yeah, that's definitely something we got to deal with in the future. Um, but I, I was, I knew that, you know, we had the program where it was 70-something percent of the teachers were white women. But that 84 percent, I mean, that's just a huge number, extremely huge. You know, an additional. Oh, go ahead, I was going to say additional. There's a, there's discouragement. I was just informed by a veteran uh, teacher uh, that uh, the pay difference for elementary level that that plays a, a, a contributing factor. Uh, even so, while a young person is deciding on what their major is going to be, uh, as opposed to if it's going to be in the education, then they're probably, by knowing what I just said, they're probably not going to pick elementary education because of that reason. Just another factor, discouraging factor. Mm hmm. And I just wanted to chime in, too, because um, at one point, my son actually wanted to become an educator. And just from his experiences as a black male in school, and even when he came, he went to school to correct errors that the doc, that the uh, teachers were presenting in, in regards to how black, pe black people were being presented at certain points in the class or, or not represented at all. Um, it turned him off. He, and, and he also heard stories from other people who were really close friends of ours who worked in the New York City school system. And um, actually, on a few occasions, my son actually went to, and this is when he was in elementary school and junior high, he had gone to one of the roughest uh, elementary schools in Brooklyn um, to speak to the children there uh, to try and motivate them and give them encouragement towards um, academic excellence. And um, just some of the just the stuff that he experienced personally, and the things that um, he knew from very close friends of ours who were teaching in in the school system, completely turned him off to it. And um, he actually one day said to me that um, he felt he was better off attempting to reach his people outside of the educational system, um, akin to what he had seen me do in my life, rather than attempting to, um, quote unquote, fix the system from within. He basically came to the realization there's no fixing it, there's no way that he'll ever be allowed to reach black children in, in a capacity as a black male school teacher. So I just wanted to throw that out there, and that's something that he actually personally went through. Thank you. Context of white supremacy. Uh, we will wrap things up. I will uh, share quickly the image that I used, uh, Professor Gassman, 
Uh, it's her standing next to the black male. I think Thomas in New York asked about that, and she explained this is a black person that she's worked with. I think they've uh, co-authored material together uh, and what have you. Uh, just put that there, just again emphasizing uh, I'm sure uh, that this black male doesn't think of her as a racist. Maybe she's proved that to him that she's not racist, but that does have a big impact. I stated that earlier, the value uh, promoting that notion that idea that there are some good white people if we just hold our breath uh, and if we just write enough material and if we're just patient we will find them and they will be cool they will be great they will hang out with us we'll have pork chops and oprah just like okra excuse me just like uh hillary clinton uh they know that that is huge in terms of non-white people and just our conditioning hoping that we can bump into maybe one or three whites that won't call us a nigger and will not be racist. Uh, we just really need to let that whole uh, fantasy go because it is crippling and it is not true. Uh, but that's why I put that image, uh, pick that image specifically. And it looks like she's holding a glass of alcohol. Maybe it isn't, but uh, to me, it definitely looks like uh, a champagne or wine glass, as though they're at some celebration. I think she said a book launch. Uh, but that's why I chose that image. Uh, we'll be here tomorrow. Patrick Phillips, Blood at the Root, uh, about the history of purging blacks from Forsyth County, Georgia. We've talked about this before. If you want to do some research, blast from the past, Elliot Jaspin, uh, his visit back in 2010, his book, Buried in the Bitter Waters, The History of Racial Cleansing. That book is not just about Forsyth County. That is like just one portion of the book, what happened in Forsyth County. But he talks about a lot of these incidents that happened, uh, as he stated, more than 250 times. And that's the most important point. I'll say it again tomorrow that you should keep in mind that this is not just a one-time thing. This happened over and over and over and over and over and how that impacts a group of people when you have these sort of widespread killings uh, and forced migrations, pogroms that happen over and over to a group of people, how that impacts uh, a group on an epigenetic level, how that impacts you financially over generations, how that impacts you health-wise for generations, how that impacts you academically for generations, just having to pick up everything and basically run to save your life with maybe the clothes on your back and that's it and lose everything. Uh, but that'll be tomorrow. Looking forward to it. White man, Patrick uh, Phillips, and I believe he is a writer. So I've consistent, consistently stated uh, whites who their training is in writing, like they teach English or another form of writing. You should be particularly mindful. In my view, they tend to be very informed and skilled uh, in the practice of racism. But that'll be tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, if you have other questions, problems. If you're trying to get information, archived information or programs, feel free to drop an email until justice at gmail dot com. Uh, we will keep working to see if we can figure out what the tech issue is to causing the intermittent drops uh, in the audio. But we'll try and see if we can get that repaired ASAP before tomorrow. Uh, we'll be here every day for the rest of the week. Uh, just check the Facebook uh, page and or the Black Talk Radio Network page. Uh, and you'll see the program times. It's all regular time 8 p.m. Eastern every day except for the compensatory call in on Saturday which is always at 9 p.m. Eastern but all the other programs from tomorrow all the way through Sunday 8 p.m. Eastern 5 p.m. Pacific uh, we'll be looking forward make sure that you are ready for extra helping of workplace racism since we'll have Wednesday and Thursday Wednesday Allison Manswell will be here talking about her book listen in which is all about problems that we deal with with racism on the job uh, thanks for all the folks who tuned in. I hope it was a constructive investment of your Monday evening, and we'll do it again uh, tomorrow. Patrick Phillips, Blood at the Root. I'll post a few uh, of the interviews that he's done about his book if you want to check out some of the uh, excerpts uh, from what he wrote about. Uh, with that, uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, good to hear from everybody. Great to hear your questions. Process what you heard. I hope some of it helps you get a better grasp of what racism, white supremacy is how it works uh, helps you uh, become less confused about this problem. Sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. Uh, again, the image that I posted, uh, it is my conclusion. Our behavior should reflect at all times that war is being waged against black people in particular. Uh, we want to make sure that we are sober and able to think, use our brain computers optimally so we can make 
outstanding decisions to keep ourselves as safe as possible, particularly if you're going to be in a vehicle, as a driver, a passenger, even if you're going to be a pedestrian. You do not want to be intoxicated. That's cigarettes, alcohol, cannabis, anything else that they come up with. You do not want to be under the influence and have that be the day that you bump into Daniel Holtzclaw, Darren Wilson, any of these other race soldiers. Badge or no, whites are extraordinarily dangerous and I mean dangerous in a life ending manner and it can happen in a matter of seconds keep that in mind at all times and let's just really make sure that we are about making sure our behavior always reflects our high understanding of racism white supremacy and that meaning that war is being waged against us that's it Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. Right. I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>